Yep, yep. Just give me a couple of seconds. Just getting set up. Oh, no problem. All right. I see Pablo. Pablo, are you there? Yes, sir. All right, cool. All right. All right. So let's go ahead and just get started. Hop right into it. So every uh, for anyone who's new to this, every, I think it's like other Saturday or one Saturday a month, I do uh, consultations that are part of our internal mentorship course. And the reason why I really enjoy doing consultations, I used to do them one-on-one. -on -one, and I think we documented that I did around a thousand consultations between 2018 and 2020. It was like two years, maybe two and a half years, 2000. Yeah. In like two and a half years, we did like a thousand one-on-one -on -one consultations. So I had about three consultations a day sometimes on average. And one thing I've realized is that a lot of musicians sort of think in similar patterns. So once I was around enough people and started to really understand the way they were thinking, it made it really easy for me to help them. Um, because I know the same struggles, like everything that someone's gone through, I went through the difference between myself. And I think at least the majority of people that I talk to is that these points, I didn't stay in them very long. So for certain people, they might be stuck in something and it might be years. And I was stuck there too. I just didn't stay years in it. I might've stayed a few months. So I was able to understand why I was there, uh, get help while I was there, see different perspectives while I was there. And because I had a very uh, definite goal, which I was going towards, I, I knew where I had to go. It wasn't kind of a, a wish or like a thought. And it was just, I have to get there because I'm very logical when it comes to life. And I know that if I want to be in this career as a musician, and let's say luck isn't on my side for whatever reason, meaning I could be an amazing guitar player. And plenty of you probably know amazing rappers, amazing guitar players, amazing piano players, but they're still not making a full-time living in their music, $50,000 a year. So we know people already who are amazing, but yet they can't even make a living. You could be an average teacher and make a living. You don't have to be an amazing teacher. You can just be an average teacher. You can be an average nurse and make a living. Not an amazing nurse, just average. You have to be an amazing musician and still people were not making a living. So when I was seeing that, especially because I wasn't that talented when I was trying to do, do music, which I started in college, I didn't know how to play instruments. I couldn't sing. So I was watching people who were amazing and I went, all right, that means as talented as people can become, this game isn't all about talent because I'm seeing people on the radio who aren't as talented as that guy at guitar. And I'm seeing people on the radio who aren't better guitar players or singers than that person on American Idol or that person on blah, blah, blah. So I'm seeing that this thing that everyone thinks is how it works can't be if the results are over here. So because of that, I took the time to then go, okay, how does this thing actually work? And I feel like once you go into that point, almost like a video game, because growing up, I used to play video games and I would get like obsessed and I'd always beat them. It was one of those things like I had to figure out how this game worked. And I was really good to where like I would win championship game things and then just quit. Because once I figured out how it worked, it, it was no more exciting for me but I would go until I won the championship. The same thing as in music. I figured out how, how it works. And once you understand this Rubik's cube and it all kind of clicks, like once you see it, you go, oh, that's been it the whole time. When that moment happens of realization, everything gets much easier because you know what you're looking at. But when you don't, if you're looking at Rubik's cube and you've never seen it before, it's just a freaking, how does this thing work? And then people spend hours and days and years and trying to figure it out. But then you'll see like a 15 year old kid go whoop, 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 his eyes closed on some YouTube channel, does a Rubik's cube in less than a minute times it. And everyone else in the world is like, how'd you do that? Well, there's a pattern he's doing. It's not rocket science. He can't see. He's got a blindfold on. It's a pattern. He's remembering, move this three times forward, move that four times back, move this, blah, blah, blah. They put it all together. And now he knows without thinking or even seeing that the result will be the same. That's what I'm trying to give for everyone here. Because the results are always going to be the same. If you follow the pattern. If you try to create something that's outside of the pattern, that does not have guaranteed results, that's when you step into wishing world. And when I say this, meaning that 
you can take the creative path any way you want. That's the beauty of music in this career. You can make anything into your career, but you got to understand how the patterns work. So, because that's where it gets easy. So, that's what we're going to do here in today's consultation. Uh, so, for anyone who's joining us today, feel free to come once every, uh, I think we do it once a month on Saturday, and I'll answer all the questions that you have. And hopefully, whatever I can give you will be the seeding of how your thought will become. And then you'll start to realize that it just gets easier and easier as you start to see the process. Um, and the reason why I like doing this, I'm telling you, I've, everything y'all are going to probably bring up to me, I've been there before. And so I know what it's like. I just happen to, like I said, follow certain principles of, okay, where's my goal? How far am I actually from it? How much am I going to work to actually get there? Where is my circle at? Because I'm going to be reflecting off the five people closest to me. How hard are they actually working? If we're going to do this as a team, if I'm going to do it on my own, then I need to raise my energy level because money is just a thought of the value of your time and energy. So if people think you're not worth a lot of money, they will not pay you a lot of money. If people think you're worth a lot of money, they will pay you more money. So money is a thought based on your value of the time of your energy. Okay, well, what increases your time and energy? Your knowledge. If you know more than everyone else in the room, you're worth more than everybody in the room. So the whole goal is having more knowledge of how to execute what you want than 90% of the people in all the rooms are going to be in, which to be honest is really easy because most people don't try to become a specialist at anything. Like most people just stop or at 60% of everything they're doing. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, I used to do that. And you're like, oh yeah, I used to be a musician. Oh yeah, yeah, I used to play in bands and stuff. Cool, how far did you go? Oh, you know, we played. That's where they get. We played a bunch of shows. We opened up for so-and-so. Oh, cool. Were you paid when you opened up? No, no, no. We had to pay to play. Oh, so you got to a certain point, right? Or someone will, I, I've heard people say this before, like they'll meet someone who's a professional basketball player. My cousin's a professional basketball player. They'll meet someone who's professional and they'll say to that person, oh man, I used to play basketball. I used to play basketball in high school. Like I was varsity and they start talking about their stories. And you're like, that's cool. Or I used to play basketball in college. I was, you know, uh, I did one year. And you're like, that's cool. But that's different from someone who's a professional ball player. It's just completely different. So what I'm going to do open today is just open it up. Any questions you have, feel no like restraint because literally anything that you've gone through, I've gone through. Um, and I'll do my best to help out. So we have our digital hands, you know, on the, the chat. So if you see that, just hit your digital hand and I'll call on you. And also just realize that a lot of times, whatever question you have usually helps spark other people's questions. So like nothing is, is like not worth it. Everything's worth it in this kind of thing. All right. So that being said, all right, Wendy, come on up. So um, I am reading really good books. Well, I'm starting to read good books on mindset yeah. because I see so much mental growth happening with me. Like, you know how you get in your bubble yep. and you think things are supposed to be this way. And this group is helping me evolve continually. And um, so I need some suggestions of some good, yeah. like mindset shifting books. Sure. I have them. I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> Because I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, well, first off, I, the question I would say is, how comfortable are with you with the knowledge of finance? Are you are extremely well versed oh, yeah. in money? Okay, yeah. and making money and yeah, saving yeah. money and investing and all that. Okay. Oh yes. Okay, great. Um, then second would be, where do you feel like you have the most lack of information when it comes to your mindset? Are you talking about patterns that you were raised with, or are you saying your thoughts of what you're yeah. trying to bring into your life? So as much as I change, like my eating habits, mm. my exercise habits, all of that, mentally, I tend to go back to, um, and this is probably a good talk for tomorrow, but okay. um, I mentally, I, I tend to go back to the way I used to think. Okay. So it's, it's like a constant shift, you, you know, because we are who we are and we were raised how we were raised and you these brutes as they say bullshit mm -hmm. rules yeah 
are 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 part of who we are. So I'm constantly having to break those. Mm -hmm. And so feeding myself new information and new new reading is helping me with that. Of course. Okay. Yeah. So there's something you said. You said we are who we are, and we were raised the way we were raised. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and in that, we have also free will to choose. Right. So what happens is a lot of times the patterns that you are programmed with, because your brain is just a, a pattern recognition machine, right? Mm -hmm. So the patterns that you are raised with, they have certain trains of thought. And if you get to a situation where you can see the train coming, the thought, and choose what's better for your outcome, and think of it just what is for my best outcome, which that theory is usually not taught to people. Um, if you look at how we are in most high schools, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking mostly of America, but there's never a, a thought exercise of building patterns of thinking three steps ahead. That's actually not even the curriculum, which it should be. Um, if the thought of, if I do this, that will happen, but cool. What happens after that? So no one really goes past it. So the first part of really breaking thought patterns is just doing what I just said going to the third disposition because that will then retrain your mind in a new pattern in a new program to always do that and it becomes very quick it becomes like almost instinctively because right now the instinct is i do that to get that it's just one plus one equals two but if you go one plus one plus one plus one that's the best desired result well, all of a sudden the whole shifting like the one plus one takes you here and that's your path but if you do one plus one plus one plus one, you realize, oh, wait, down there, that's going to really mess me up. You get to go, the whole entire path shifts. And this thought pattern um, is done in a lot of games, chess, you know, the game Go, Jiu-Jitsu, something where there are um, consequences to losing, where a lot of times in life, people have this I idea system that it'll all just work out. But the weird thing about that is we know tons of people who it didn't work out for. Like everyone knows the cousin or the uncle that it didn't work out for. Everyone ha might have a brother or sister didn't work out for. And some people didn't get a chance to see it work out because they passed away too early. So we all know that as being a reality. But at the same time, we sometimes avoid the reality that the choices have to be done in the moment and not over time. Because that's the best way to start reprogramming is in the moment. Like right now, I'm going to choose to think three steps ahead on whatever this thing is. And right now, I'm going to choose that. And if you constantly do that, what happens is you program, you could probably reprogram yourself in a month because okay. it's only 21 days to a new habit, you know? That's true. So, so I can take the approach of how I handle money in my investing. Exactly. That there same. You that's why I asked you the first question. That's yeah, why, yeah. that's okay. why I asked you first, how are you with money? Because, <laughs> <laughs> because if you said, oh, I don't have any real substantial understanding at the, all the core levels and I need a little help, I would say, oh, here's some good investing books and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But money is really just, once again, the value of your time and energy. So if you take the same understanding of the thought of money and put that in your time and energy for your musical career, yeah. it becomes the same thing. And so I see your face right now. You're like, aha moment. I have, like, aha I moment. <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. I have so many epiphanies these days. I'm telling you, it's just like, good. oh my God. <laughs> Good. So good. thank you. That, that makes pleasure. perfect sense. So that's why I wanted to know before I said, well, read this book or do this thing, because here's here's what I also believe. There's a large amount of, of industry that's based off of people writing books and blogs and stories. And, and we are very story focused uh, beings. Everyone has a story. And that's why people say things like the chapter and my journey and my path. And I I go, yeah, but do you realize the reason why we're the only part of generations who are using words like that is because every night before you went to sleep, someone read you a book that said those words. They said, and the chapter and the princess and then the next journey and on the path. And the next thing you know, the person's an adult and they're just repeating words that they had. But before this, people weren't talking like that. The journeys were actual journeys. You might not make it home alive. That was like, I'm going on a journey to East Africa to find spices, might not make it back. Going to India might not make it back. That was a journey, right? People now, you know, they just go from one school to the other and they're like, oh, it was a journey. I had a, had a drive. I packed up my car, my electric car with the paved roads. And it was, it was a journey. And so we documented it. I have a vlog all about my journey. So the thing that I believe in 
is that we're much more simple where you don't have to read a 300 page book to know, just think three steps in advance and take the thing that you're best at, which, or that you're really good at, like you said, investing and correlate those attributes, to the thing that you're weak in right now. And what you'll tend to notice is that your, your patterns um, don't ch change. So if, if I'm, you know, super passionate about music, I'm going to be super passionate about anything that I'm passionate about. If I'm, if that, I'm the person who goes all the way in one thing, I'm either going to do the same thing in other things. I'm not going to go halfway because that pattern doesn't change, but I have to correlate the two. Like for instance, for a long time, I wasn't caring about money because none of my friends were. Everyone was thinking, let's just make songs and we'll make money and there'll be hit records. And then we can go to the bars and we can spend it on people that don't care about us. And that was part of the scene that I saw. And then I got to a point where I thought, well, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Let me start to think with the same brain that I do with these video games and with chess and with, yeah. with, with uh, martial arts and the same exact pattern skills of timing and, and looking at things from different perspectives and mechanics and structures and architecture of things. Let me use that same thing in music. And once I did that and I started looking at money, I was like, oh my God, I probably spent tens of thousands of dollars on people that I don't even know. Why was I doing that? Why was I trying to make friends with people who I really didn't even care about their ethics or their morals or like didn't, if I really sat down and talked to the person and I didn't want anything out of them, if I really sat down and went, do I correlate with you? And the answer probably 99% of the time would be no, I don't even want to be around you, but I'm making it seem like I should because of the scene that I'm in. So once I did that shift and I realized it was just a simple pattern change, just like, everything changed. I don't spend money on things unless I need it. Now, I, the wants of the back in the day, the, the wants I don't have because I've had the nice cars, I've had the nice places. Yeah. And I realized at the end of the day, sh less stress is the best thing because I've seen people. So much <laughs> oh my gosh. I've seen people who have this experience where they are so run down of, of their life. And it looks like a part of them has been sucked out. Like their, their being has been removed a bit. And then usually when I ask them, you know, like, what's going on? A lot of them just tell me is all the stresses they have. Yeah. It's really what they start to say. They're like, oh, I got so many bills and I got, I got this mortgage and, you know, I got this going on and I'm trying to do that. And they always say, I'm trying to do that, whatever their passion is, I'm trying to do that, but I got this. And everything they say is something that they created. Yeah. So I'm like, well, why did you create all that stress for yourself? And most of the time it's because they were told to by the media, by society, by this other world that does not care about them on a personal level. So that dysfunction in it all leads to depression. And whenever you pressure anything too much, if you pressure a bone, it's going to break. If you pressure yeah. an economy, it's going to burst. If you pressure a relationship, it's going to be ruined. Anytime you put pressure to something, it cracks. So I'm always in the mode of what I was saying before is find the simplest route to the end result implement that on a daily basis know that it's going to work because it's always has throughout all of evolution so it's not like it's going to magically not work for you it's how our brains work and surround yourself with other people who are doing that and that's the way our dna works you start to then change and then you look around in a year and you go wow that was a really different year and i've I'm completely changed who i am as a human being and i wish i would have known this 10 years ago <laughs> that's yeah. what i did <laughs> you know for sure for right. sure. That makes so much sense because I think about like in my role at my nine to five, mm -hmm. like I have a system of helping students find either employment or housing or what I know exactly who to go to, how to do. I do everything in a system and I'm successful every single time. Same okay. thing with investing and putting my money away. I do things systematically and I do and I have the I have the foresight to say this is what's going to happen. So I'm going to plan now. But when it comes to my music, it's like I have a shift through my brain and I just do stuff different. I don't know why, but this, mm. this makes perfect sense because whatever system works, you just need to do it. And then you can fall into the right pattern and then have the success that I, that I crave. So, there you go. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> You're, welcome. You're very welcome. All right, cool. Um, let's see. Does anyone else have any other questions or insights you'd like to pop on about? <laughs> I see Zach looking for the button. Are you looking for the button, Zach? Yeah, straight up. I couldn't Go find ahead. it. <laughs> Go ahead. I saw your eyes, um, man. Okay, hop on on. Uh, um, 
you talked about some finance books. Uh, I wouldn't mind getting a couple of ideas just to, cool. you know. Yeah. The first one I will say is um, The Millionaire Fastlane by MJ DeMarco. Um, that's the first book that I would recommend to anyone. Um, and I think after that, there's others that I can, I can break down and the reasons why I like them. But I would definitely have that one, even if you do the audio book. The audio book is great too, to be honest, because that's what I first listened to. Um, and the reason why that one's so important is because he breaks things down so systematically and he shows you results that aren't based on your emotions, but just like how the structure and architecture of certain businesses have to work in order for them to be profitable, which most people don't really look into. Yeah. Um, so I would say read, uh, read or watch, do the audio book, but then I, if you coupled it with these two things, I'm going to tell you, it's like your brain will just go into a full complete makeover. And one is watch the TV show called the profit. It's with a guy named Marcus Limonis. Yeah. I see Wendy laughing. She must've watched it. Um, so, uh, Marcus Lemonis is a great business person, entrepreneur who walks into businesses that are failing. And then he, he basically restructures them and he shows you why they're failing. And the people don't even realize why, you know, he comes in and they have like businesses that he'll buy for, you know, a hundred thousand, like $200,000 or $300,000 for be a 50, 50 partner. And they're about to go out of business anyway. So they're like, all right, we'll take this last chunk of money for this guy to become a business partner. And within two weeks, they'll be like, all right, here's where you were spending too much electricity. Here's where you're spending too much on your, your cost per item. Here's where you didn't have the right salespeople. Here's where you didn't market correctly. Here's how you doom, 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 doom. And these are people who've been in business for sometimes seven, 10 years. And so all of their friends and family, you know, they are a business owner. They have a nice house, but everything's falling apart inside. And they're literally top too far from bankruptcy because they're doing all these things and technically they've made a million dollars, but they haven't made a million dollars. And so they're just keeping this cycle going. So Marcus comes in and like literally just chops away stuff. And I think the fact that he shows you how he's doing it, you can once again, take the patterns and put it into anything. Um, the other show I would say watch is shark tank. And the reason is if you watch shark tank and specifically, I'm going to tell you how to watch it. Because they like to, you know, dramatize everything and there's the storylines and all the other stuff. And that stuff's great for entertainment. But watch when the sharks um, uh, all bid on the same product. Mm -hmm. Whenever it becomes a shark frenzy, watch those moments. And here's why. When you see what everyone reacts to and is willing to throw money at, which remember just a thought of the value of the energy and time it will take to make their money back. That's all that they're thinking. When all of them throw their money down and you see a bunch of those episodes, you'll correlate the patterns of why they all did it. And then you'll see it in yourself and you'll see it in other people. And I'm telling you, once you do this, someone will say, hey, man, you should totally come by and we should jam and we should make a project and da, da, da. And your brain will go shark tank mode and it'll go, does this person seem like they're really serious? Do I really think my time will be worth it in the investment of this? Is this almost like a guaranteed outcome or I'm going to be putting more income and not get you start to go to that mode and then you'll say you know what it's better for me to continue the path that i'm doing where i actually can get better at what i need to do because i'll be worth more value in the next five years your brain does that but if you don't have this kind of information what you'll do is you'll be like yeah this guy's fun and cool to hang out with let's see where it goes and then a year or two passes nothing really got accomplished and you can say we recorded some songs but they're just songs that nothing's really happening with them and did you technically get better to be a, a competitive at the real craft that you're trying to be at most of the times the answer is no it was an exercise but it wasn't an execution which is different so i would say those three things shark tank look for when they all they all bid at the same time when they do a shark frenzy and then ask yourself why did they do that I can tell you the answers to that. We can talk about it another time, but there, there is, there's a thing that uh, certain components that they, when that happens, they all bid at the same time. And so look for that and try to come up to it with, on your own. Look at um, Marcus Lemonis, The Prophet, and then Millionaire Fastlane by MJ DeMarco. And if you do those three things in a couple months, you're going to be a changed mentality. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very welcome, brother. Adam, I have to say, you have just described my music life, period. <laughs> like, literally, period. I would go looking for producers. Oh, that sounds great. Let's do something. Nothing, you know, have fun. 
but it's not getting me anywhere. So yeah, I just had to question. add that. Did, did you ever, did you ever <laughs> experience this? Um, and the only reason I'm asking you is because I've heard other people say this kind of sentence where they say, you know, I was just talking about finding a producer and then I met this person. So I feel like it's meant to be like, I feel like it's synchronicity. And mm. I was just talking about it last week and then I met so-and-so. Have you ever experienced that? No, because okay. my cases, I'm like looking for people. Oh, you're like looking. Like gotcha. Looking. I stopped that though. Because okay. <laughs> I've gotten some some people who say that where they, I was just talking to my friend last week about a producer and then boom, I'm at this bar and this guy says he's a producer. And I'm like, oh my God, it's meant to be. And I, I'm like, did you ask to hear their music first? Like, have you even listened to them? Oh, well, they're about to send me a SoundCloud link. So, but you know, I just met them. So, and they'll start to tell me about all the things they want it to become before they even know what it actually is. And especially when it goes wrong is when, well, that happens a lot with executives. When someone's like, I'm looking for a manager. Oh my God, I just met a manager. And you go, who do they manage? Well, no one yet. But they're they're looking to manage. I'm like, do they have business experience? Like, have they run a company that's successful? Like, uh, I did, they come to a lot of my event. Okay, no, it's different. Or when someone says, I was talking about a producer. I met a producer. He wants to record me for free. And then I go, mm, what were you wearing when you met him? And they're like, oh well, um, I mean, I was just you know, like I was just out. They, yeah, but what were you wearing when you met him? Like, I just, I'm just curious. Oh, like you know, like tight outfit my stomach was showing you know like tight pants da, da, da. Oh, okay and did he ever hear you sing well no no i mean it was real loud in the club so we didn't no no no. did he hear you sing don't tell me the scenery or how it happened like did he hear you sing yet well no but he offered to record you for free well yeah i guess he just felt my energy no listen 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 listen, listen i don't know what world you're in but no one gives you free things based on your energy when we're talking about a business based on your voice it doesn't happen that way. Um, so I've, I've seen just a lot of different stories over the years and they all usually come around the same situation. It's like uh, most people, like I said, there's this, um, for instance, here, a very simple thing, right? Um, we're learning, or I shouldn't say we, my wife is learning herbology, right? So she is intensely learning this stuff and she'll come back from a class and tell me things that I had no clue were going on and the infrastructure of trees and plants and everything, like how it all connects and how they talk and how they spread different uh, glucose through each other's and the roots. And it's, it's, a, it's a deep, very deep thing when you start to understand how the, the farming works. It's so deep, the nutrients, the minerals. Most farmers don't know about all this stuff. So there's people who are technically in the farming industry, but they don't know what's in the actual soil. And they don't know how certain pesticides affect the foods that they're in. They're just putting it on because they think it's good for the plants to keep away the insects. But they don't actually know what's happening on the deeper rooted level. But they're farmers. That's the industry we're in. We're in an industry where a lot of people are musicians, but they don't know how deep the frequency they're creating is. They don't know how deep ruining relationships could be. They don't know how deep building a network actually is beneficial. They don't understand these things because they can, they can be allowed to put musician on their Instagram and there's no qualification test. If there's a qualification test to put a name on Instagram, like doctor, you have to show your doctorate. We'd have less people saying that they're musicians. Like prove you're a musician first, prove that you're a producer, prove that you're a songwriter first, because there is no prerequisite. Anyone can give themselves a title. And unfortunately we're living in a self-titled world and it's becomes quite delusional. And not only is delusion bad for the person, it's bad for the, the people that also support the delusion. And it becomes then a group. Um, uh, it's like a, a, so a whole society will start to agree on something that is, doesn't make any sense at all. Instead of saying, hold on, hold on. And just asking simple questions. Are you telling me you're trying to make, and then here's the clarity of this. If you want to make um, $100,000 a year, which most people say whenever I ask them, I'm not saying anyone here does it, but... Most people say, if I ask them, how much money would you like to make a year from music? What would you consider being success? And most of them say 100K. That's like the balancing point. You know, Some people have said to me $10 million, but most people are like, I just want to make six figures a year and I call that success. And I say, okay, cool. Let's take that, that theory. So in 10 years time, you're telling me in one decade, you want to make a million dollars from something. And when I tell it to them like that, 
in one decade, you want to make a million dollars from something. Then they go, oh, yeah, yeah, I guess that's what I'm saying. And I go, okay. So out of that million dollars, you want to do that. But some people don't want to be one of the best in the field that makes a million dollars. You have to be one of the best in the field of this to make a million dollars. Because there's the piano player we all know and the guitar player and all these other people who are way crazy talented and they're not making anywhere near a million dollars. So I think once the question is actually realized, but most people aren't asking their friends that question. And that's the thing. Most friends don't do it. Most music school teachers don't do it. They don't say, okay, you plan on making a million dollars in 10 years. And the, then the person would say, okay, how do you plan on actually doing that? That question is never asked because everyone wants to feel good. And that's the part of the society that unfortunately creates delusional people. And I've met these people who will tell me all these stories like, yeah, I'm, I'm talking to so-and-so and blah, blah, blah. And I'm sitting there the whole time going, okay. And they're trying to tell them, get me excited about their story. And uh, this person produced it and they had a hit back in the nineties. And I'm like, okay. And I'm not changing my demeanor and, and they're waiting to say something that's going to excite me. And I'm like, listen, Everything that you just said does not how the real business works. So to me, it, it just sounds like chatter. But to that person, it's like their lifeline. And they're holding on to it tight because that gives them the card to talk to people sometimes. Like I'm working on this and so-and-so's producing and da, da da And it's just so much easier to go, do you have a bunch of high quality songs? That's it. Do you have 20 songs that if you were to play them back to back to back, that any other executive, producer, manager, top level artist would look at you and go, wow, these are really good. If you don't have that, you just need to work to get that. That's like the first place to start. Just, just think of it like very simply, I need to get 20 songs that when other people who are my peers, who are making the success, who are touring the world, who are on the radio, if they were listening to 20 of my songs, that I have a group in there that they'd be like, whoa, this song is really good. Because we all know the feeling when we hear a really good song from one of our peers or someone that we think is talented, we're like, that's a really good song. So that same reflection has to be felt from our peers. And I think that part, a lot of times, is just, you know, people send their songs to their friends. Their friends are like, yo, this is really cool. This is really cool. And you're like, cool. Can you share it for me? Yeah, I just shared something last week. So, you know, I can't share it right now, but. But when you have good music, trust me, people will share it. They will share it. I, I didn't, I'm not into the digital world that much. You know, I come on here on YouTube and I, I come in on, you know, Instagram and pop in from some time to time. But I really didn't understand the idea of super fans. I would hear people talk about it. Um, I have a friend named Rick Barker who used to manage Taylor Swift. And Rick would talk about super fans. You just need super fans. And I'd be like, super fans? Like, who are these people that they're talking about who, who have this time to share music and they go online and, and it kind of felt like a unicorn thing when they would say it because I just wasn't accustomed to it. And then I started seeing it and I started realizing, no, wait a second. This is a big world because of the internet. It's a massive world. There's people from all different kinds of countries like, and you don't know what they're doing. And if you have really great songs, they will share them and they will download them and they'll pass them to your friends and they will write you and they will say, I'm your biggest fan. And they are genuine. They are genuine about it because to them, maybe the, the, MTV is not programming them on who to think is the coolest. So they're just on YouTube going through and they're also on Spotify and then they find your music and they go, wow, this is really great. And they actually become a fan. So that's why I'm saying, if you just start with, let me get 20 undeniably great songs, you can actually start seeing things out of just the beginning of that. You can start seeing fans actually be like, I genuinely think you are amazing. You are my, 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 the artist that they follow, you know? Um, and I, I'm telling you, I didn't even know it existed until recently, um, in the last two years. And then I really started seeing it and I went, wow, like even on our Sons of Legion page, we'll have people who are generally coming by to support us, who will do things way out of, there's one woman, she's so sweet. She like sends our music to different playlist people and she takes her own time to do it. We've never even spoke, but I've seen this. Rishi experiences the same thing when he uh, released his music lately, his people come by, like you're my new favorite artist. And it's not had to have be MTV approved. It didn't have to be VH1 artists to know. This is just, it's how people are searching for music. So I would say get that goal. And uh, until you hit that goal, don't, don't give yourself a cookie in a sense. <laughs> no.
Don't that, give yourself. I like how you said that. I like how you said it because a lot of times when you do when when I interact with artists, it's it's a lot of the me me me. I I, I did this. I did this. Yeah. And you don't have the substance. The songs are your like your your stocks. They're your yeah. assets. And that's not going to change if they're quality assets. They're gonna they're gonna do a lot of things. You know. They're always going to be quality. Right. So that's that's a really good point. Yeah, I'll say this. And most most people don't experience what I'm about to say unless they actually have big catalogs. But when you have big catalogs of songs, they become kind of like um, a recycling of your own. You basically create your own recycling center. That's what happens because you'll record. Let's say if you record 50 songs this year and out of the 50 you know, 20 were good demos and 30 got finished. But out of those, there was like five that were really, really good. And those five you were able to place and make some money on. You're like, okay, cool. This thing's working. And then next year you do another 50. But now the songs all get better because now you have some training. Maybe you took some courses. You studied with a songwriting coach. You got better. Now that next 50, you have 10 songs that got placed. And you're making money off the five from last year still because you're getting residuals. By year five, if you've done that, you've done 250 songs. You probably have 50 placements, but you have now 200 that are in this recycling bin. And then next thing you know, without realizing it, some of those old songs will start to get placed. Because I didn't realize that for me. So I have songs that were, are being placed now that I wrote four or five years ago. And when I wrote them, and this is important to note, a lot of times because we live in an instant gratification society, we have the assumption based on the programming that when we do something, we're hoping that there's a result that happens soon to reflect the hard work we put in. So we make a song and we're hoping that it makes us some money or it breaks, oh, shoot, let's shoot a music video. Let's promote it. Let's, let's do all these things. Let's get it out there because we just did it. And so I want the reflection. But if you don't, let's say you put a song out and you don't get a positive reaction. And then you're going, okay, so something was missing there. Mm, okay, well, I'm just doing it for expression anyway, so it's not that big of a deal. But once you start doing it for a living and you say, okay, well, maybe that song wasn't ready yet and you keep it in the recycling bin. But now over the next five years, you've gotten credits, you've made more money, your ear has gotten better, but that song still has an amazing melody. That song from five years ago still has a great hook in it. You can go back to your own songs and be like, yep, taking that song, redoing that one with my new ear, my new mindset, my new network, my new connections, and that song will place in a month or two. It just didn't at that point because I didn't have certain things. So I feel like part of it is realizing that what you're doing is part of the process, realizing you have to build a big catalog, but that catalog becomes a recycling bin. And as you get better, those songs can be recycled or sometimes songs from the past get placed anyway. And you didn't think they were even that good sometimes. You, you gave up on it because you thought, uh, this will never go anywhere. I mean, it, it would have, someone would have liked it by now. There's a couple songs that I literally thought that this song is so good. Pitch it to a bunch of people, like publishers and managers and everyone. And people telling me the same thing. Oh, this is a great song, great song. I'm like, okay, someone's definitely going to sing it. And I had Jennifer Lopez sing one of the songs. And I'm like, tell my mom, I remember it's my birthday. I took her out to dinner. I'm like, mom, Jennifer Lopez is singing my song today. I'm going to take you out to dinner and tell you that. She freaks out. Oh my God, you know, crying and everything. This is so great. You've been working so hard. Then we find out six months later, JLo's not putting it on her album. And then we're like, ah. Then we have another singer sing it. We have another singer sing. We had like five singers sing this one song. Nothing was getting placed. Pitch it to Rihanna. Rihanna was thinking about doing it. She didn't want to do it. Finally, four years later, in the middle of the night, I get a call from one of the writers. And I'm so glad this writer named Chantel Krasuviak, she was still pushing these songs. And that's the importance of your network because I didn't have the network she did. So I was just writing it and hoping that people would like it. And I had a few executives I'd write to, but Chantal is one of the top writers in the industry. So she just felt really powerful about the song and they would land somewhere, even though she had gotten a bunch of no's. And then she placed it on her own and it got put in this big movie. And that song literally has been making money ever since. And it's got over a hundred million views on YouTube. And if anyone ever watched this cartoon, it's called Leap. Um, whenever I say, have you heard the song Rainbow? They're like, yeah. That's like my favorite song from the album. And if you look at that album, it's got Demi Lovato on it. It's got Sia on it. It's got Max Martin on it. It's got all these people that I looked up to. And I wrote it four years prior. So I was looking up to all these people 
writing songs, not getting the results I wanted. And then four years later, the same song plays on the album with all the people that I was looking up to. So that's why I always say is like, just make your catalog, make sure that it's good. And when you have that feeling, and I will say this, this is very important. There's a different feeling, which takes time to calibrate, but there's a difference between you writing the best song you've written versus you writing a song that's one of the best. It's different. You got to calibrate that thing. That thing takes a little time. I know what that's like when you're going, this, this sounds great. This sounds great. This song this sounds good, you know? And then you play for some friends and they're like, oh, it's good. And I'll tell you what helped me to figure it out. And it, I'm, I'm doing my best to kind of explain the, the, the sensation you should be looking for. Because one, it's, an, it's internal and two, it's external. So let me tell you the external version. When you play a song for a friend and they look at you and they say, you did this? That's the first thing. When they're shocked, they're like, you did this? And you're, yeah. Now that's some people, they do it anyway, but that's the first part. They go, you do this. And they go, can I keep this? Can I like play this? Is, am I allowed to play this? Am I allowed to share it? When your friends say, am I allowed to share it? Am I allowed to keep this? That's the second external one. The third one is when they say, I'm not kidding. You sound like this should be a hit on the radio. When those three things calibrate externally, that's the reactions that your friends will make when they all do that same thing in a row. When it's, wait a second, you did this? Like, can I, can I hold on to this? Like, I want to play this in my car. I want to play this in my, my playlist. And then do you, like, do you mind if I share this with people? And this sounds like it's a hit in the radio, like right now. When those three things happen, that's the external representation from friends and family. Because if not, what happens is they'll just say, oh, this is so good. This is so good. Wow, you did such a good job. That's different from what I'm talking about. And so slight nuances that make massive differences. The part internally where, where you go to it is when you play a song and you play the radio or you play a playlist and you put yours in the middle. So you play this song, this song, your song, another song. If you can tell that it's your song, meaning like the quality of the production goes down a little bit, the mix doesn't sound as good, maybe the vocal didn't cut through as much, maybe you're starting to hear that some of your rhyme schemes didn't land as close as they could have, maybe the tension release wasn't as big or maybe the drop wasn't as interesting, and you hear that, if you can hear the difference, then you know it's just one of the best songs that you wrote. When you can't hear the difference and you go, nope, that song is just as dope as all of those songs, that's when you know you wrote one of the best. So one's internal and the other one's external. When they both line up, you got something on your hands. You got something really good on your hands. Especially okay, if you can cool. play something for someone like me. And I go, wow, that's great. Like if I'm like. Yeah, because listen, yeah. Adam, you, you know, you, you, ah, you beat us up, but we need that, you know. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard pill mm. to swallow, but I'm taking a big gulp of water and just mm. chucking it down because. I need that change to happen. So I appreciate you. And thank you so much for what you do. <laughs> You're very welcome. I have a quick question though, because I thought it was interesting. I'm very, um, I'm very direct with the words I use because I'm, I'm held accountable for the words I use, right? So I think sometimes we use vocabulary that is not in correlation with the actual thing that's happening, right? So I know jokingly you say beating up, right? And I just want to question this for a second. The reason why I think sometimes people feel or even would even use a word that has even slightly a derogatory term, which I know you didn't mean mm -hmm. it in any derogatory term. Yeah, no, but I, the yeah. reason the reason why people would even use that word is because in their daily life, no one's actually being honest with them. Right. So the thing is, is, is what I always do is I just ask everyone to be their excellent version of themselves without mm -hmm. giving themselves um, excuses that the rest of the world will agree to. So that way they yeah. actually can be held accountable for their future. It's right? necessary. It's, is, it's, is it's necessary. a corrective necess. And so, yeah, beat up is not the right word naturally, <laughs> but um, all too often people want to coddle yes. and say, well, do, 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 do. I oh, do yeah. it. I do it in my role as counselor. You know, I don't want to say you got to get it together. I want to say, listen, if you don't do this, this is what's going to happen. Instead of you want to graduate or not, 
Okay, let me ask a question. Why, why don't you? I, I don't know. I don't know. I, <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying do it. Maybe. I'm not know. saying do it because I don't know how sensitive we're, we're living in a world where where everyone is hair trigger sensitive. Yeah. And it's unfortunate yeah. because it's creating a world of very weak people and of very weak people uh, trying to deal with the harsh realities of human nature and, and nature in general um, are only going to be taken over by the nature that's around us and the humanity that we have inside of us. So I don't agree with, with, with coddling weak mindsets and then growing them and then pushing that out there. I think there's a weird narrative going on right now in society where they're trying to take away alpha characteristics, which alpha characteristics created everything that's on this planet. So it's really weird when they're trying to remove those characteristics that actually help society. There's only, I understand balancing them, but when they're trying to remove it by betatizing everyone and making everyone super soft and super weak, the reason why I think they're doing it is because it's easier to control people when there's no alphas Ooh. around. Like it's really easy to <laughs> see exactly like, check this out. If someone walks in and says, I want everyone to stand in this line and do blah, 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 and blah, 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 blah. And there's no alphas in the room, everyone will do it. If there's a few alphas in the room, they're going to go, wait, 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 do what? Why? For who? Why do we have to get in the line? I don't understand. I'm a free person. Why should I have to do these things you're telling me? And then the person will, because you have to believe the way I believe, says who? So, well, I'm so confused on where you think you have seniority over me. See, that question can be triggered to an alpha who will, who will uh, push back. And so what I'm seeing in society, unfortunately, is they're trying to remove alphas because they know at a DNA level that if they can do that, the control is always in the powerful hands of people who have more money. That's a so, really good point. I, I, cause I, I break down things very simply in a sense of our nature is already wired in us. The best that you can understand how it works and decipher the coding and then learn how to go with your coding and with others, even e much easier life. Cause you can see things ahead of, ahead of, like I always see, uh, okay, that person's acting this way because of this, 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 and this. And I can see it all. Cause that's how that person's nature is wired them. Yeah. But the person will give me all these reasons oh, it's because of my mom or it's because of my dad or it's because about my money. And I'm like, no, no, it's because of how you're wired. But you don't want to accept that you're wired this way because people have a distinction between I'm a human and I'm an animal. Like they think that they're not connected. While they're, they're literally eating a chicken in front of me. And they're like, I'm not an animal. Like biting into a side of beef. And they're like, I'm not an animal. I'm like, what else eats animals other than other predators? Like, I don't know. But that's what I'm looking at. And when you, I was going to do a breakdown. I think I might do it. So there's a TV show that, that, um, that we just started watching called uh, Naked and Afraid of Love. Okay. Oh. Yeah. So what they do is they put a bunch of people on this island and they're just naked, right? Oh, and they got, yes. they, I've seen and they, it. Yeah. But it's, see, the one I saw before is Naked and Afraid, which mm -hmm. is different. But this, this one's, one's with love. Naked yeah. and Afraid of Love, right? So they have to go on these little dates and stuff. And what's really interesting is when you remove cell phones, clothes, um, your social network, your hier hierarchy and where you think your status is in the world, and you're just naked with someone on a random island, your DNA quickly goes back to being primitive. Like it's so fast. And you can literally see in the conversations people are talking, you can see everything they're thinking because it's in their body language, it's in their micro expressions and how their inflections of their voice. It's how they talk to the camera in one moment and like, oh my God, the casting director, they pick the perfect guy for me. And then they find out that there's other men on the island and the girl in the very next line will go, you know what? I got to weigh out all my options in the very next clip. And you say, why? Because now she realizes there's other potential alphas on here and her DNA is wired to pursue the best alpha for procreation. It has nothing to do with anything else than that because it's on a TV show and it's recorded. So the person is not even thinking like, I look crazy from just saying, I think I might love this guy. And the very next line, say I can leave him for someone else or something better. And it happens right in front of you. And no one's going, hmm. But all the guys, the guys are trying to make it work. The guys are like, all right, so I uh, want to get to know you better and da, 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 because the guys are sizing up. Is this someone that I want to spend time protecting, investing in, possibly going on more dates with? The guys are thinking in the primal sense, is it worth the investment? So it's really interesting when you see the way our DNA is wired and you can correlate that in business, in relationships, in your career, networking, 
everything is wired based on tribal understandings because we are pack animals and so is most of all other predators or anything that work that live through evolution they're packs birds fly together wolves hunt together lions are move all in a pack we are pack animals our group is a pack yeah. move is a pack right and in order for a pack to survive you have to have group thought towards what the intentions are if everyone's just doing completely other different things and it's never going to survive at the highest level when lions are together they're thinking as one okay we got to yeah. find that and you're going to stay and take care of the kids and so unfortunately in today's society they're dividing the pack and that's where the power is. That is if they the can, is. if you can divide the pack, where the men and the women are even getting along, and this yeah. this color and that color don't get along, you're dividing the pack. And if you divide the pack and remove the alphas, you have so a bunch of zombies just following. There you go. There you go. That's super wow. easy to control. That's super easy to control. Yeah. All right. That being said, um, any other questions? I see banners on. What's up, Banner? What's up, man? What's up, man? How's your eyes? Uh, uh, it's uh, feeling supposed to be better, but um, yeah, I'm still maintaining this. I'm actually I'm doing this awkward position so that because I got bubble in my eye right now. Oh, this okay. bubble is pushing up my uh, retina to try to like you know make it flat again. And okay. uh, yeah, yeah, man, just taking things slower, a lot slower lately. You know, because I can't really using. Can't, can't really be using uh, my eyes too much. Oh, so, man. Uh, oh, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm trying to work on music a little bit every day. But other than that, just a lot more uh, just rest, listening, man. Like podcasts. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah. Just just listening, man. You don't need to be looking at any screens like crazy. I'm shocked that you're even here right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I get to listen to it. And, okay, uh, cool. I get cool, to speak cool. with my eyes closed, too. All right. So, all right. It's still neat. But, um, but, yeah. But, hey, but, hey, since I'm here, yeah. so I'm actually, um, so I've been digging into a lot more like, you know, the crypto coins and like mm -hmm. the NFT stuff, man. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's like, yep, quite revolutionary. Are you, are you seeing you seeing what's happening, huh? Yeah, yep. It's, I mean, I mean, I don't know much about NFTs, but for just for crypto coins, man, like that's like, because yep. like dollars always depreciate every year, mm -hmm. but like, but crypto coins. I mean, the right ones, obviously, you know, there's some mean ones, but the yeah, right ones are ones. just going to appreciate all the time because there's limited supply. And I'm just like, whoa, like that's new gold, but that you don't have yeah. to carry around. And there's, there's a, there's a good and bad thing. Okay. So I'm glad you brought this up Yeah, because we do have a mentor in the group who has a social currency company and he came in and spoke about it uh, about three months ago. And he's one of my good friends out here. So the way his coin works, which we're going to try to bring into our own group is, let's say everyone purchases their own um, uh, coin. That's like a Billboard 500 coin. And as more members come in, your coin goes up in price. And then as the group values itself, let's say once we start getting a bunch of cuts and a bunch of credits and we open up our own like little publishing wing, your coin goes up in worth. And the more time you spend let's say taking courses or coming to these kind of events like consultations, your coin goes up in value. And then you can also cash it out on Ethereum or Bitcoin or something like that. You can do a cash out as well. So he was, he's basically created this, this company um, and they do NFTs as well. And we're, we're actually working on a project, which I don't mind sharing here a little bit. I can't tell you what it's for, but it's like one of the biggest things in America that's going to be happening in December. It's like a big, let's say like a, uh, competition it's one of the biggest competitions in in all of america and we're working on a uh, a nft with music hybrid where there's a painter who's doing a painting of all of the contestants of this competition and it's in a time lapse and all of the contestants are putting this time lapse video of the painter painting them uh, onto their social media and people can then purchase the painting in the hopes that obviously the person who wins will be the, the biggest painting, you know? So you're hoping that this person wins. Let's say it's American Idol. You're hoping that that person wins because then your painting's worth more money. Mm -hmm. yeah. But in the painting is an NFT connected to the song that we're creating. And it's actually with group members that in our, in our club. So the song is gonna be attached to all these paintings and all the writers and producers are gonna get a cut from the purchase of the painting.
So someone can, and let's say someone buys a painting for $50,000. And that means the artist and producer is getting a percentage of that. They could probably make more money off selling this painting than they would putting it on Spotify for three years. Yep. So I do agree that NFTs, social currency, um, and I think once we get around piracy, because I'll be honest, like no one's really advocating for the fact that you, the rights that we have as musicians. I mean, there, uh, I, should say, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say no one's advocating. People are trying to advocate and things are getting changed, but enough musicians don't make a living from music to care. If, if everyone who made music cared, this whole thing wouldn't be going on. Like if, if everyone who put a songwriter or a musician or producer or artist on their uh, Instagram profile had to click a thing that said, we do not agree with being paid 0.004 cents on Spotify. That's ridiculous. And we do not agree to um, uh, having companies collect our money. If you, don't, if you don't even know your song's being played in some country, but they can collect it in their black box. And we do not agree that, um, and you just went through these things, like all these things that we all know are collectively wrong in our industry. Like there's no real... There's no real union that brings up things. People don't have to go to school to become managers. You just say you're a manager tomorrow. There's no test you have to take, but you can't do that in any other field that makes the amount of money. Like lawyers and doctors, everyone has to have a certain legitimate prerequisite to have that job. If we all said we don't agree with this, so we have to change it, we have to change piracy policies, where if someone is caught stealing music, that person loses their, their IPA address, IP address to be able to go online. There's a block on their IP. If people really started to treat it like this, all the musicians would have money. Mm. Like all the musicians in the world who are really trying this would have money. They would at least yeah. be making a couple hundred dollars a month. But because enough don't know to fight it and they majority just want fame to be the when they, when they want to wake up when it comes to money is when they get fame. There's a long way between starting music and fame. So in that long way, people have to make a living. But you don't realize it till you get your first ASCAP check or your first BMI or CSAC check and you go, wait a second. Wait a second. There's not a lot of money here. And then you start finding out, oh, there's a lot of people who don't have a lot of money. So what are these people on Instagram acting like? Oh, those people are just pretending. And then you start meeting them. Oh, that gold chain isn't real. That diamonds aren't real. This car of yours was rented. All this house that you're living in is your manager's house. And your manager happens to have money from a previous business venture. And he figured out he just get a bunch of people to pretend. And they're selling the idea to other people. When that all comes to light and you go, I wish someone would just tell us about the business and then we actually could change it. So it works in our favor. And that's like a big thing about our group. I think as people are going to start to make money, everyone's going to start to go, Oh, wait a second. No, we got to really be on top of this stuff. But most people don't do that until they realize they have to make a living. I don't know. I don't know what that's about, but I tend to notice that most people don't really care. So NFTs, blockchain, uh, social currencies, I think are the way to help artists start to get into groups, start to make money, start to see that business mindset plus music works because most musicians don't even try to learn business. And NFTs is kind of that thing where you don't have to be a genius. Like you just be like, oh, my friend's a dope painter. Let's couple this painting with my song. You know, my friend's a great blah, blah, blah. Let's just do if we can do a collaborate. Collaborations, I think, are easier people to understand than actual business, you know, architecture. Mm -hmm. So hopefully um, in the next, I think, five years, that'll be one of the saving graces that will give artists a real leg to stand on because <sighs> I think if more people knew they can make money, they would do music that actually serves themselves and other people rather than trying to be versions of themselves that they're not only to give away their power to an industry that wants to take advantage of them and turn them into self-sabotaging uh, robots anyway. But if someone can go, wait, no, I can make the music I want to make and I don't have to whore myself out and I can make a living. I think everyone would do that. I think the whole music industry would change if people knew they can make money without whoring themselves out. Right. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I've been listening to like some podcasts and talking about how, you know, NFT, I mean, NFT is like when it's, it's like win-win pro type yeah. project too. It's like, the, um, like the buyer, the, the, the purchase, uh, purchase and art and the, the art goes up in the value. 
the mm-hmm. buyer sells it and the original maker of the art gets a portion too yep. so it's like the original it's like a royalty and yeah yep yeah it's crazy i mean lately tory lane's um yeah i saw that game yeah and yeah he sold like 100 million but one hundred million. Yeah. one million yeah one million. I mean, and, I, st- yeah. I still don't understand, but when I saw that video, I was going, okay, I don't understand. And I don't know the, the details of the shooting or all that stuff, but I'm not even understand the world that it, in my eyes, once again, I don't know the details. So whatever I'm saying is could be out of context. If there's more information that someone else knows, let me know. But I don't really go into social media that much. But I, last thing I saw, there was a thing where he possibly shot someone. I think it was like Megan the Stallion or something. Right. There. Right, there's some controversy about that, whether it's okay. true or not. But anyway. okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, so for me, when I saw that, and someone was like, "Yeah, I just want a, mil- I just got a million in in a, in a in a minute or whatever," and I was like, "Wait, what world are we in that someone can possibly shoot someone and then they sell a million records?" But here's the thing: even if it wasn't his situation, there's other situations of artists out there who have shot people, who have killed people, who are and making money off of this idea there's people like cardi b who talk about drugging and and robbing people like and they make money our unfortunately our value system is so valued towards greed that money is the the new god in a sense that yes i think nfts and blockchain and all this stuff is good and that's the reason why i say if people can make a living doing music they actually enjoy i think good music will be supported and not shock value music and music that is just for um people who are literally just trying to push an envelope that they don't need to push and eventually resounds in other people going to jail, having bad relationships, single mothers, fathers aren't around. Like it just, there's nothing that promotes anything of good. And so I can't promote it. Like I don't, I don't agree with it because I know the outcome and I see it in our society. I see it, you know, in, in different parts of, um, because my family's all different mixed races. So I see it in all these different cultures and I'm like, no, this isn't helping, but the music they're listening to, they think it's cool. And they don't realize that the music is actually helping to define the horrible situation that they're in. And so it's kind of like that misery loves company thing. Cause they're like, Oh, you hear this new song just drop. And then I listen to the lyrics. And then I look at the person's life and I'm going, yeah, you're living this life, but you're not living it with the million dollars. The person selling you the life is the one doing that, but you're living this drama, the baby mama drama, the drugs, the in and out of jail, like you're living that. And that's not good. This other person's buying themselves out of jail. This other person can afford their child support you're trying to live that life and it's destroying you. The same thing with female artists who are telling other, other artists, like basically helping women to become sex slaves of themselves, which is wild to me. They call it empowerment, but they're enslaving themselves and it's other women who are helping them do it. Like for me, I just can't give shine to all that stuff because I know how detrimental it is. I'm looking around going, is anyone seeing that if you don't raise children with at least trying to have both parents, yeah. things go a bit off? You know, like I know how hard it was for my mom as a single mom because my dad passed away, but it's hard to raise a child on your own. And if you're looking at how people are being raised now where everyone wants attention and they want just clout for being loud and not very intelligent, when that becomes the norm of value, our society is just going to get in a sense, like just dumber and the technology will take over because the technology will be massively smarter than everyone who's here. Like quantum computers and then Cardi B. Like revolving on the same sentence. It's, it's just, it's too far. So yes, I agree with NFTs and all that stuff, but um, I just thought it was crazy when I saw that a million people downloaded that so quickly to support something that, you know, like I think it's part of the downfall of our society. Wait, but um, of course, yeah. Um, it seemed like did you did, did you have any concern about NFTs and blockchain and uh, coins too? Like her, it's, it seemed like besides pros, you also have built. Oh know, well, the the con the con is that money cons. is just a thought, right? So, like for instance, you're your dollar or whatever you use in, in your country, that is just a thought that it holds value. Sure. But if I was to remove that and give you a seashell and let's say seashells in your area were very, very valuable, your seashell would be worth the same thing as that dollar, which goes to show that it's just a thought of what that value thing is based on the people in the area. 
So with coins, it's interesting because that's just a thought. If you ever ask someone like, oh, how does this work? They're just like, well, we mine it. Well, how do you mine it? Well, because we use energy to do this. Okay, what happens when we get free energy sources? Well, then I guess it's easier. What happens when you use quantum computers? Well, I guess it gets easier. So what's the value? Well, it's just how we think about it. So if Elon Musk can make a tweet and the whole market crashes, it's a thought. It's not backed by anything. So the wild thing I was saying is, okay, now imagine this. You work really hard. You build up a large portfolio of coins. Then you don't want to get a vaccine. All of your money is digital. It's not owned by you. It's not in your hand. It's a lot easier for a power to control you when you don't have what you want in your hands and they do. When a bank has access to everything, and I don't know if everyone saw it, but like the banks in America are, they're trying to do a mandate where everything that comes to your PayPal, Venmo, any banking situation you have to account for. Um, and that accounting for it means they have access to anything over $600. The government has never been involved in people's finances like this until this last year. So back to this thing I was telling you about, let's remove all the alphas. Let's have a bunch of people who just fall in line Let's put everything onto a coin base where it's all digital. The easiest people to take your money are going to be hackers, not thieves. No one has to break into your house. They just have to crack your password. That's a kind of thief that we're not used to, someone who's just smarter than you. See, all throughout history, thieves were usually someone who was like needed something, right? They had nothing, so they'd break into your house because that's all they could have. That was one kind of thief. Then we had another kind of thief who's strong-armed because they were just more powerful. I'm just more powerful than you, so I'm going to use my power to take what is, is, is what I want from you. We've never seen the masses of I'm just smarter than you. Now, when you take an intelligent people and then make them really good at being thieves and it's not really cracked down upon at a high level and they're taught how to be hackers from a very young age, that's something that our, our world has not seen at the highest level yet. And so ransomware, ransom bots, if you're familiar with those, I asked, uh, I was actually producing this artist, it was like four years ago, and one of his investors was a high level security um, computer expert who dealt with anti theft and anti hacking. And he was one of those guys that I asked him, How'd you get into this? And he's like, You ever heard of those stories that there's like a 16 year old kid who's trying to hack into like the Pentagon and then the FBI surges house and with guns blazing? He's like, That was me. I was like, Really? He's like, Yeah, I was that kid, like to a T. They came in with, AK-47s and rifles. My mom opened the door. They bust through. I'm in my computer. I had like five screens up. I'm trying to hack into the Pentagon, all this stuff. And he's like, and I was doing it. And he's like, so they, they give me a deal, basically. Do I want to work for them or do I want to continue on this path? And he's like, so I started working for the government to help them to thwart things. And now, I own, he now at this point, he's like, oh, my private own company. Um, and so he does, uh, helps out major companies and personal people when they have uh, situations. And so I asked him, um, and a good question for anyone out there, whenever you meet someone who has a very interesting job or very something that you're like, wow, there's, there's, there's a lot of angles to this. I ask one question. What is the one thing that keeps you up at night? Because you get a lot of information from that one question. So what's the one thing that keeps you up at night with your job? His answer, this is five years ago. He's like ransom bots. I had never heard of a ransom bot. So I said, okay, tell me what that is. He's like, okay. Basically what happens is let's say you go on a website and you know how sometimes other websites pop up when you click on something. It's like maybe you're watching a movie that you shouldn't be. It's like you're pirating a movie or looking at something and things start to pop up. Sometimes you don't know it, but what's downloaded onto your computer is a small ransom bot script that basically lies dormant on your computer. And then if you have anything in your house that is a smart something, so a smartphone, a smart refrigerator, a smart washer and dryer, a smart computer, anything that's smart, Smart means it has access to Bluetooth and it's open to taking direction and use coding and backends. That's what caused it to be called smart. He's like, so what happens is it goes onto your computer and then it sends itself duplicates to everything that's smart in your house. And you don't realize. Pretty cool. What's a, yeah, it's pretty cool until you tell me, I tell you what happens. Yeah. So it goes to your refrigerator. It goes to your washer. It goes to your yeah, dryer. It goes to your microwave. It goes to all these things, right? Then what yeah, happens then what happens is when it comes into it and uh, let's say you go online and you break uh, $80,000 in bank account. Let's say a personal one bank account, $80,000. Oh, great. I got saved $80,000. Well, your password there and your 
entry to your, um, your bank account number is all there. It sends a signal to all the dormant bots to wake up. Boom. They all are like, Whoosh. at the same time, they go Whoosh, at your computer and they lock it down. Your computer now is locked down. And it says on the ransom bot, if you want to gain access to your files again and your accounts, you have to pay us this percentage of what's in your Chase account, dot, 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 dot number. And it usually is percentage based on what you already have. So they're not, trying to, they're not trying to make you broke. They're trying to take a cut of what you have and you have to pay them. And it says you have to do this within 48 hours or we're going to clean your account out. So when I asked them this, I said, so how, how is this happening? Is this happening all across the board? He's like, it's happening at major companies like Visa, Target, but it's also happening to individual people like yourself. He's like, so I get called for this all the time. I said, well, how hard is it to fight it? He's like, extremely hard. These hackers are really good and they're starting at younger ages learning how to hack. So this is five years ago. I told so many people about this stuff. I was like, man, there's this guy who told me about ransom bots and everyone looked at me like, huh, ransom bots, I've heard of it. And then just about six months ago, they did this massive thing on Vice talking about ransom bots and how it's been taken over and how all these people are freaked out now because we've never experienced a thief like this ever in history. And I, all this stuff I'd said five years ago, they just did a thing on Vice about it. So if you get a chance, check it out because this yeah. is a part of the world that we've never experienced when everything's digital. It's a lot harder to come into Banner's house unless I have a gun. If it's just a guy who walks in your house, give me your money. Banner's gonna be like, no. So in order for someone to give you your money, they have to either overpower you, have more people or have a weapon. But other than that, you're just not gonna give away $80,000. But if someone has a ransom bot and you have coins and they lock that down, you'll give it up so quick because you won't have access and you won't have control. So there's, like I said, there's good and there's bads to it. So I think it's about playing both fields, to be honest, just so you're safe. Because if you put it all into one and that one backfires, I think that's going to be probably one of the biggest parts of the breakdown of human society is when someone realizes they have no money because they had nothing on them. Damn. Yeah. Because I got, yeah, I, would, I mean, in my mind, I was, I, was, I was thinking like, oh, blockchain is supposed to be unique and duplicatable i guess so i guess unhackable but then it's then it's your account can be hacked your account exactly. can be hacked think about this if one, wherever there's <laughs> money wherever there's a gold there's gold rushers wherever there's a treasure there's treasure hunters yep. wherever there is money there's people who are going to figure out how to get that money the interesting thing about society is that if you remove greed and money as being the, the highest order, you don't need probably 60% of the police force. Just that one removal removes the reason why you need police. But then, yeah, but that's almost like a part of human nature, right? To want money. So here, check this out. This is, this is interesting. They did a study where they took capuchin monkeys and they taught them currency. They literally okay. taught them like this chip is worth this much and you can get this out of it. I'd be shocked if you guys knew what happened within a very short period of time. So here's what happens. Okay. <laughs> the DNA wiring of the female monkeys says become escorts. They start to sell sex for the chips. That's their first thing and it happens super fast. There's something in the wiring that says, if I have this and I can use this, and it's the easiest um, form of trans, you know, trans, um, like That's trans, true. yeah, it's like communication, but also bartering and be able to commute to this, to that, and any way to get from here to there with the easiest level, the female, vunk, um, female capuchin monkeys resorted to, resorted to escorting. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. How then you look, you look at OnlyFans and you look at those things happening right now and a lot of that's what's happening is there is this rush, this gold rush to make money from basically digital prostitution. That's what it is. And they want mm -hmm. to be normalized in a society to where it's also not questioned, but it's happening at such an alarming rate that it's going to throw off a bit of evolution because the way men are wired is when we're with a woman that we're deeming as being a potential mate for long term, 
we're questioning if this person is going to raise a child with us because we want it to be a similar replica of the person that we're settling down with. If the woman we're settling down with is willing to sell her body for money and we have a child with that person, we are in fear that that child will do the same thing. And no one's actually saying that, but it needs to be said because that's just the honest truth. Whenever a guy meets a woman, he's thinking, is this a hookup or is this long-term? Those are two ways the guy thinks. Mm -hmm. If a guy goes, this is going to be long-term, he's not going to want to raise a child with someone who's a digital prostitute. The scary thing is though, in 10 years and 15 years, because no one's actually challenging this in the mainstream media, because women don't want to say anything about it because they feel like they're all their fan base are other women. So they don't want to stand up against that. It's going to be normal for someone to have, what, what was it back in the day? We had parents come to school day yeah. and they're going to say, what does your mom do? And they're going to be like, oh, she's a digital prostitute. That's what Jimmy's going to say. And then Billy's going to be like, mine too. And they're going to be like, where's the dads? No more alphas. Not there. And so it's just, it's just a very, we're in a very interesting situation right now where it's unfortunate that people who are using logic is being deemed as being, um, uh, judgmental when logic becomes judgmental because of someone's feelings, we're, we're already off kilter in our planet. And until enough people start to say, wait, 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 wait a second, you're free to do whatever you want to do. But that doesn't mean that now I have to deem you as being someone who I should respect or someone who I'm going to like take orders from, or I'm going to take care of you. And I'm going to raise you do whatever you want to do, but don't think that it, it deems you some sort of value that I'm not willing to give you. That doesn't make any sense at all. That's like someone saying, if someone robs someone that we're going to be like, oh yeah, but now I want that person who I know is an open thief to be close to me in my network, even though I deem that what they're doing is not morally in line with me. No, I don't have to. I'm not going to give that person a pedestal. I'm going to put them exactly where they are. And it's going to be outstretched of putting anything into um, a possible drama into my life or family organization. That's how everyone's acting subconsciously, but no one's saying it. So it's unfortunate because we're running into this really interesting place in time where beauty is, is valued. But what happens is after you hit a certain age, a female's beauty goes down in value and if you're just selling sex and you have no value past 30 for that, let's say if, if that's what you're focusing on, the age from 30 to, to 80 is 50 years. That's rough. 50 years. And I think what people are just thinking of how hot they are now in their mid twenties, like early thirties. I'm like, if you plan on living to 80, that's 50 years. You got to live in this world. How are you going to live in this world for 50 years? If you don't have an income, mm -hmm. you have to learn how to really manipulate. It's the only way it happens. Because there is no, like, lucky 50 years. Hmm. You could have a good year. Mm -hmm. You could have a little run. But 50 years and not being very skilled at something and not having a husband who respects you to help you take care of a family. Like, without having these things, we can, we're really going on a very touchy point in history. And it's all because people are getting hypersensitive about their emotions and not using any real logic towards evolution. And we are wired a certain way for a reason. It took us a long time to get to where we work the way we work. And now we're trying to dismantle it all. And, uh, you know, I agree with equality for the job. If you're equally as good as that person, and you both are equally good, you take a test, you figure out who's the best. I want to pay the best person. Yeah. I want to put the best person, not male, female, white, black, Chinese. No, whoever's the best of the job. That's who I want to hire. And when we're getting into a world, we're like, well, you can't do that. It's like, wait a second, wait, how does that make any sense? That's how everything in evolution worked. The best kept going, which made it better, which made it better. And then it kept getting better and better. And that's how evolution worked. That's why we're designed the way we are. Survival if we of start, the Exactly. If we started letting in, check this out. There has never been a time point in history where the weakest were the ones making the rules. Facts. We're entering it right now. And when that happens, there's going to be a, like a, like a, um, it was a seesaw effect where it's going to go roosh. And I think it's people are starting to see it now. Hopefully it takes another couple of years, but here's the important part. If they don't get it before the rise of AI, we're talking about millions of people who are just screwed. Mm. Because if you look at statistically of just like, let's say jobs and stuff, 
if most people only go to a 60% level of things, and it's the reason why I tell everyone, no matter what you do, just become a specialist. That's it. Like, I don't care if someone's like, oh, I'm an electrician, become amazing at it. Just become amazing. Have information that other people don't have. Because if you're a specialist at anything, you are worth value. But most of our society doesn't want to become a specialist and they also want specialist rewards. So that differential of time, space, energy, knowledge is going to create a large depression. Now, when AI comes in and AI is a specialist <laughs> and it takes it two days to learn the program, you know, and it comes in yeah. and then what happens is, let's say some woman um, wants to get a job, but for the last three years, she's been doing digital prostitution on OnlyFans and nobody wanted to judge her because that was the time of period. And then what happens is this AI they brought in at the company does a, a facial image search. So you give them your, your, your ID number and they look at it and it does a facial, whoosh, everything on the internet. It's called digital footprints. It finds everything and it pops up and tells the owner of the company, Hey, this person has been doing digital prostitution for the last two years. Here's all the pictures. Here's all the links, blah, blah, blah. That owner of the company is not going to hire that person. When that starts to become a norm in the next five to 10 years, when AI really takes over, I think we're going to see a really massive drop in in uh, employment and relationships. And uh, it's gonna be a more pointing fingers. And a lot of it's gonna be pointing fingers at themselves. It'll be a lot of, I was pointing at you and now I got to point at myself, but I don't want to point at myself. So I'm going to keep pointing at you. It's going <laughs> to be, it's gonna be a lot of this. Hmm. And see everything I said, it, it's no emotion. You can see it. You're like, oh yeah. Cause that will happen in this many years. And then that will happen in this many years. And then when there's more AI, there'll be less jobs. It's already happening in Japan and other countries. They have more AI, there's less jobs. Okay, so that seems to be what's happening. If we do that in a country like this, or like an American country or major nations, oh, what's going to happen? Well, the people who are rich are going to get richer. And the people who are poor and get poorer. So there's going to mm -hmm. be no middle class. When there's no middle class, how can you hold up an organization? You have no power because the people with the most amount of money have the most power. And then you remove the alphas. And then everyone's hypersensitive. Oh, that's going to be a tough place to walk around in. So like employers are actually already doing some of that. It's just not really widespread because I know when I'm working with individuals on job search, I'm like, make sure your LinkedIn is okay. Check your Facebook, check your Instagram, because digitally, what are you looking like? So when that becomes a trend, like yep. everybody's doing it, it's going to be yep. a major Yep. And see, here's the thing. What we're talking about is just logical facts. That's the part of the one plus one plus one that we we're talking about earlier. If you do this and then in a couple of years that happens, if you don't realize it's going to happen and you just act like wishful thinking and you're not thinking proactively, it's going to negatively affect you. And most people are not thinking proactively. They're thinking reactively. I want this. So I'm going to look like that. I want this, so I'm going to do that. It's very much, I want a banana. I'm going to do what I need for the banana. Instead of, how do I learn how to grow bananas? How do I learn how to build my own banana farm? That's when I tell everyone, build a catalog. Just build. I'm always saying, build your farm. Build the things that will, con recycling center, that was regrowth, regeneration of your own farm. And I remember like when I was a kid, I would read, um, I've read different, you know, uh, religious texts before and uh, lots of metaphors and things like that. And the one thing that my dad, we had like a little farm. And one thing I got in a very short period of time, just looking at something is when you plant seeds, you got to plant a lot. Not all of them are going to grow. That's just nature. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so I'm thinking like, all right, he planted a lot of seeds and we got this many tomato plants going. All right. So, and then there's a harvest and it comes back around so the time for that. So we need to have enough that we can constantly keep putting into this if we plan to sustain ourselves off of these fruits and vegetables. The same exact thing with music. You gotta have enough songs that you can constantly be harvesting. You're gonna sometimes pull out some money from them, but not all of them are gonna land. They're not all gonna grow into beautiful trees. And that's okay. That's just how it works. But when everyone just focuses on that one thing we're talking about, just, just beauty, I'm like, that's the one card? And then people get mad and say, don't objectify me. And you go, well, what else are you having on the table? Because the only thing you're bringing on the table is an object. Are you bringing in 
different perspective and and more morality or are you making something better are you inventor are you thinking outside the box like what do you bring to the table and if you're just saying well my body and my looks well that one value piece is going to constantly go down because we are not going to be the same person we were when we were 20 it's just that's and no one is go look up any supermodel who was in their 70s they don't look like how they look like when they were in 20 so therefore they're not being paid the same amount it's just this is normal logic in that industry, but knowledge can always grow. And that's the one thing that I'm always saying is, listen, you can literally be 20 year old knowledge. And when you're 70, you'll be that many times more worth the value if you're constantly doubling down your knowledge base. But if you're doubling down on your looks base, that thing's gonna continually go down. So music, same thing. If you're op- keep going better music, you'll be worth more value, more value, more value. But if you just do one, you know, all you're doing is this one sound and you haven't executed it yet. And you don't learn mixing. You don't learn production and maybe you just have a good voice. If your voice is that's all your key you have, that will go down in value. Because as you get older, there's other singers who sound just like that person. So I think it's always best to kind of look at the actual playing field that's there. Don't sugarcoat it and then approach it with as much tenacity and genuine accountability for what you can do. And I think in today's day and age, we have so much we can do. Like the fact that we are here from all different countries around the world right now and having conversations like this, this would have never happen 10 years ago, 20 years ago. No, no. no. You, you were writing letters 50 years ago. Yeah. I'd be like, Hey banner, how's things going? Love to hear back from you, man. It might take a month. Yeah. You know? <laughs> for a while. Yeah. And now we're like, Hey, NFT is blockchain. Let's talk about it. Yeah. So We're in a really, like even production wise, you can go online, we can teach production on your computer. 10 years ago, you had to go into a big studio and pay $500 a day. You had to sit there and get a mix done from someone and you didn't have any programs that can like Ozone, Ozone just masters things real quick. You didn't have that 10, 15 years ago. So like even when it comes down to all the hit song formulas I show all of you, I didn't know that stuff when I first started. And now when I know it, I can go back to songs in the 40s and 50s and see it's the same exact patterns. It's been there the whole time. I just didn't know it. So I just feel like there's so much, especially with people in our group who like really get it. There's just so much that you can just take in and run with and then level up that just we had no access to just 10 years ago. Yeah, I I mean, I think it's the best time to be alive right now. Like a lot of people are remnants seeing of, you know, the old days or whatever. I'm like, nah, I think I'm, I'm thankful that I'm born right here, you know, just, you know, and, and the, the, the recent. Uh, no, I know, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> like this, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. like, I'm, dude, I'm 23. No, like, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, I, sure. I agree. I agree. I think. Um, Opportunities, abundance. Uh, yeah, I truly. Th- well, for, here's the thing. Look, look at some of the names in the, uh, and even some of our household items. An average person today, average person has a queen or king size bed it's called a king size bed because kings are the only ones who used to sleep in it the average person has that bed the average person has internet access that goes worldwide no king or queen ever had that the average person has food delivered to them and if it's not hot they will get more food for free from the company (laughs) the king or queen only had food delivered to them So the average person of today has access to more resources, more opportunity than kings of the past. And here's the scary part. But then they give themselves titles like queens or kings. But they haven't deserved that title yet because they don't have to see over a large community of people and make sure they can all eat and survive. They have no responsibilities of the queen or king, but they give themselves the title of a king or queen. And that creates more delusion. So we're living in this world that's pretty much semi-delusional. A lot of it is based on the stories. Uh, I was watching something earlier that I thought was really interesting where um, this woman was talking about, uh, um, she said, oh, we did a, they did a poll and they noticed that most guys on a first date, they said it so innocently, that most guys like women who have a nice demeanor. And everyone was like, yeah, yep, pretty normal, yep. And they said, but most women don't. 
they like men who are a little bit bad. And the women said, yep, that makes sense. So you had these men who are like, yeah, we'd like someone who's just good demeanor and nice. And the women were like, we want someone who's a little mean, which is a kind of a interesting polarity there, right? But here's where it gets interesting. Then the woman said, well, why do you think it's like that? And she said, well, I've taken the time to study romance novels and there's actually an arc to every single one of them. It's actually like a playbook. And every, in every single romance novel, there's a woman that finds a guy who's brooding and off-putting a bit and distant. And he's the most attractive one out of the area. And she finds a way to get close enough to him to help him open up to her. And then she creates him into being a quote unquote better person and better lover. That's every single romance novel broken down. The woman was saying after she studied that. And so the way I look at things is not emotionally. I go, yeah, it's called programming. It's literally called a TV program. It's called a yeah. radio program. It's called a program because it's programming you. So when you have all these people in society going, I want the bad boy who doesn't seem to pay attention to me who leaves me without texting back, who dates other girls. Who, I want that person because I'm going to magically fix him. And then that person isn't fixed. And the woman goes, men are horrible. And you're going, no, 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 no. You're falling for the guy in the program. That guy is that guy. He's not changing for you. So we're just in a very interesting time point where people are being programmed and they don't like the results from the program. Instead of stepping back and going, I'm just going to think three steps ahead. I'm only going to put my time and energy into things that are worth value, period. I'm not falling for fool's gold. I'm only going after real gold. I want things that can be rooted in foundation. And if it's not rooted in foundation, then it's probably rooted in some sort of fantasy. Why would I walk down a fantasy road if everyone else I'm looking at on these fantasy roads are completely bonkers? Like you look at Kim Kardashian. She's got like three or four husbands, bunch of kids running around, single mother now, four kids. Like, who would want that? Jennifer Lopez, four or five, I think she's been married or engaged seven times. Like, who would want that? And then people are like, yeah, but you go, girl. Like, go where? Why, why are you cheering this on? <laughs> there, there is no male, and I tried to figure this out the other day. I, I was said to a friend, I said, what male is known currently and successful strictly off of his looks? <laughs> Brad Pitt, I don't know. Nope, nope, nope. He's not known for his looks. He's a good looking person, but he's actually a great actor. Mm -hmm. yeah, he's he like is. a really great actor. That's what I'm saying. Someone who's just known for their looks. Mm. Beats me. Yeah. I can't really think of one right now. Yeah. <laughs> I can't think of one right now. Think, think on it. It's a very interesting thing happening in our society where we're forgetting that we're giving people power power to delegate influence for reasons of value systems that are not truly valuable. Huh. And I think enough people, once you start to look around and go, Oh, no wonder people are so manipulative. They're literally showing it in every TV show. Every TV show is programming people. Cause we were talking about, you know, the levels of programming the other day. And I said, all right, let's say you're sitting down watching a TV show and a friend walks in and says, is the show good? And you're like, yeah, it's pretty good. And they say, what's going on? You start to tell them the layers of manipulation and drama in the story so that way they feel enthralled to be a part of the adrenaline. So let me give you a perfect example. Someone goes, the show's pretty good? Yeah, it's pretty good. What's it about? Okay, so he and her used to be best friends growing up, and then he started sleeping with her best friend. So to get her back, she was pissed off because she never talked about the relationship. So then she slept with his best friend, got pregnant by him. But now she's telling, and you start to tell him, and then he got money from that person's investor. And then so-and-so started to take money from me. You start to tell them all the lines of manipulation that are happening. And then the person goes, ooh, that sounds good. Most drama TV shows are all about the manipulation practices of people closest to each other. And that's a scary part. Husband and wife manipulating, boyfriend and girlfriend manipulating, best friends manipulating, brother and first brother manipulation. It just teaches manipulation on a program. Then you look out in society and go, no wonder why everyone's messing up. They're all teaching each other how to manipulate each other. That's crazy. 
if everyone was thinking about how do we get the best outcome for all of us involved and look at actual things, not feelings, but actual things, manipulation would start to slow down because then someone would have to be called out on it. But right now there's a lot of manipulation tactics like sexual manipulation. Literally magazines are manipulating women to be sexual objects. And then on the same thing say, you're empowered to do this. So women magazines are manipulating women. Women are then using manipulation to go use it against men and themselves. And then there becomes this weird dichotomy. And that's the part I feel like if we just started to look at manipulation at what, what it was and what it is, men manipulate using power. Women manipulate using sex. There's way more women with sex than there are with men in power. That's just how the world is. So until there's like a realistic adjustment to say, hey, wait a second, we should probably not manipulate anyone. Why well, do we work together? As long as greed and the value system is at the top, and we keep highlighting people who don't have archetypes that are actually for the benefit of humankind, this thing will continue until a person awakens himself and goes, wait a second, I don't care about your value system. Your value system is stupid because I'm looking at all these people who've been following your value system. And they all, a lot of them end up in worse off places, drug addicts and not of rehabs, you know, people got depression, Britney Spears and all this stuff going on. You see these people, it's not like a good, happy road. There's a lot of dramas in that. So I feel like it's important for enough people to start waking up, looking at the value system and going, let's change the value system and do, doing music that you actually care about. So that way you can teach the next generations about like, no, make great music, have a good time in life. Don't manipulate people. Don't get pulled into the dramas and don't listen to this TV that's trying to get you to buy shit because that's what they're all trying to do is just get you to <laughs> buy stuff because you've, you've never seen a commercial for Gucci. You've never seen yeah. a commercial for Prada. You've never seen a commercial for Versace. They don't have those commercials on TV. You know why? Because they know they don't need them. They can manipulate women to have women manipulate men to get them. So they don't need to put a commercial out. But they're also the highest price items. So they put commercials for things that you need at the home. Oh, you need uh, paper towels. You need everyone's like, yeah, but you never see a Gucci commercial because Gucci is a couple thousand dollars. So in order to sell you that idea, you have to be forced to believe in the delusion of paying that much for a bag that only costs 150 bucks. Because the only, and I think about it, the only way a logical person will spend money on something that doesn't make sense is if they're forced to or they're tricked to. Right? Never, never knew that Gucci didn't have a commercial or ad or anything. That's have a, you ever seen one? No, that's it. it yeah, you're right. And I watch Super Bowls and whatnot. And even there, like, you know, the ones that pay the most money, yep. you never see them. You never see them. You know where you see them? On the red carpet. It's when someone yeah. says, hey, who are you wearing tonight? And they go, oh, Gucci made me this thing. And then a million girls are like, I want Gucci to make me a dress. Here's the crazy thing. If you're the lead of a TV show or a movie, you've got money. Why not make your own dress? Put your own name on it. It's not that hard. You can literally hire the seamstresses from Gucci. And be like, listen, I'm going to the red carpet. I want to make my own dress. I'll pay you 10K. Cool. So when they say, whose dress are you wearing? You're like, my own. But instead, they give a million dollar sponsorship to a company for free because the company made them a dress, which cost that company nothing, peanuts. It's crazy. And it's, it's, so, it's so wild when I see people and they have like, like a Birkin bag or something like that. And I'm like, do you realize that one bag could have saved a whole entire village? That one bag could have saved 200 people from dying. That's crazy. If you really care yeah. about humanity and someone's like, oh, I'm a vegan. I totally care about humans and I care about <laughs> animals. And you're like, I don't know how much you care or you want people <laughs> to think that you care, that you care. It's a difference. Value systems. Mm -hmm. Value systems. They're yeah. all off. And they're all off only because of mass media. America created the only three mass marketing and media outlets, which is TV, radio, and internet. So America created those and they use them to program. And so what happens is once America created the, how a program should look, everyone just started copying it as almost, it was like a box lunch. You know, if you think about the, 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 everything's exactly the same in every country you go into, like the way the credits roll in the beginning, the way the credits roll at the end, the laugh track, 
the hierarchy, the arc of the tension release, um, the, the levels of dramas, what's happening, uh, the, the quick witted kind of humor has to land on this line. That's taught and it went all around the world. Otherwise there'd be different ways that people would do things, but they don't because the program was installed for so long. And that's why you'll meet people from other countries and they're going, oh, I used to watch American TV shows all growing up. And you're like, why? Because it was the first. Not because it was the best. It was or just the first. copied in other countries. That's Same exactly. Same program. Exactly. Different language. Yeah, Ex that's exactly, exactly right. Exactly. Okay. Um, you, that being uh, said, what's up? Uh, oh yeah, I was gonna say, I mean. Not bad. Um, <laughs> well, do you, you got any like you got you got you got any coins that you're looking into or you I have are a few coins share? I have a oh, few sure. coins yeah um we have a few coins and we have friends who are in the this this space we actually have some of the mentors in the group there was one um two or three mentors came in the group who were, who were dealing heavily in coins and some of them were out here recently we had meetings about them and it's it's like the thing where a lot of people are investing in these coins and they're able to make good livings and they sell the coins, they get some back, they teach other people how to use coins. It's like a thing. Um, but I, what's good I, when I'm saying all this stuff is that I have privy to some friends who have half a million dollar companies. I'm not half a million, I'm sorry, half a billion dollar companies. And I have some friends who have multi-million dollar companies. And so I can ask them all mindset stuff. Like, what do you think about coins? What do you think about coins? What I tend to notice is the people who have the biggest companies, the most amount of, 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 I would say, financial influence are the ones who go, yeah, I just don't know yet. I just don't know yet. They're like, I'll get a couple, I'll get some stuff, but I'm not going crazy. They're like, I have a lot invested in gold and silver because I know you can hold on to that, but I don't know the, the, you know, it's too volatile. If I buy a bunch, something crashes, it's too much. But the people who have a couple of multi-million dollar companies are like, this might be my way to get a quick advancement. Or if I get in now, I can go from a $1 million company to a $4 million company if I just invest correctly in the next couple of years. So I have noticed that, that some of the people who are at the very top are like, yeah, I have some, but I'm not going all in yet. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I think that's because they have more to lose. Right. And so you don't have, you don't necessarily have any coins that you recommend or. No, I like mean, honestly, in our family, my wife handles all that stuff. Right. Yeah. She handles all that. She looks into it. She like our friends, she'll call them and, and email them and get advice. And that's one sector when it comes to coins, because my brain instinctively knows how money works, where it's just the value of a thought. I know how fickle people's thoughts are. I can invest in something that I know is inherently has the ability to completely crash mm. based on fickle people and governments who want power. Like, for instance, if tomorrow the governments have a new world order and they say, yeah, you can't have all this coin stuff, it's gone. And then someone goes, no, we'll just build our own system. And you're like, yeah, you can build our own system, but we won't allow you into banks and we won't allow you into certain shops that the banks own. And a lot of the Federal Reserve owns a lot of places, let's say, in America. So, yeah, you can go into that store, but if you try to go into all these other ones that are owned by the Federal Reserve or for the government, you can't get in. And if they're like, well, we won't even take your coin at hospitals. We won't take your coin at blah, 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 at schools, at different kind of establishments. There's going to have to be a whole new regime to allow. And I'm not saying it won't possibly happen by any means, but I'm saying there is going to be a, a situation of, of friction in that. And if, if people get too much power, then the government, the government will push back. But don't you think then the people would push back as well? Yeah, which back would create a civil war. Yeah. Which would be Australia right now, a little bit. There you go. Yeah, I know. I heard about uh, all the, the big time, big time lockdown situation happening in Australia right now. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, listen, I think we are in an interesting place where, yeah. like, no other animal on this planet is being governed. Bye. Unfortunately, the reason why people need governing is because they don't hold themselves accountable. We've given so much accountability to the government it's like where someone could be having unprotected sex all the time and then the government takes care of the other children you know like well, how does that work you had unprotected sex and now the government's paying for you and then you can constantly get on these checks and then if the government doesn't pay for you then you know there's all these different ways of working things out like if you have this many kids and this much money and it's all this stuff and you're like no no stop having unprotected sex 
It, it just starts right there. It starts with the mindset, but because we don't have accountability, we, we push it off. Um, so I think as long as there is people who are not holding accountable of themselves, we have a governing system because in actuality, if there's once again, no money, nobody would rob each other. Like you wouldn't have to worry about being robbed if everyone just, no one had to have to have to have more greed than someone else. You can leave your door unlocked unless someone is a crazy person and wants to hurt you physically. You don't really need a lot. So I think, uh, you know, government is only here for our society because our society is not as accountable as it should be and live sometimes in a fantasy, fantasy world where all the other animals on this planet have actual accountability from other animals. And so they're fearful of their lives and survival at all times. So they know I'm not going to cross this line with that person because that other animal might hurt me. But in our society, someone's like, I'll spit on you and you can't do anything. And you're like, why would you do that? Because I was feeling it. No. Yeah, it's because you think there's an invisible line that people can't cross. And then someone crosses that line and then everyone's like, I'm the victim and you can't blame the victim. And you're like, that person just spit on that person. <laughs> that's crazy well i'm a woman he can't hit me if you spit on him he's got the right to defend himself like, oh, what's going on here so i don't know there's just like i said with the government and stuff like that i don't think we need it i don't think we need armies i think there's a thought that we do and that thought continues it to have tons of billions of dollars like think about it. if we erased all armies yeah. think about all the money that can go into actually helping society we're talking about billions of dollars. Everyone said, listen, we used to need wars in order to take over land and, you know, get treasure and, you know, pillage. And that, that was part of the beginning of history. But we realized if we do that to this country, we're actually cutting off a trade supply now. And why would we cut off trade supply when it's fruitful for everyone? So how about this? We just don't go to war with each other. But we understand certain human ethical roles of not harming each other. And you take on a certain level of equality that we all agree on. It's not saying that'd be radical. Just so we all agree. Don't harm people if you don't have to. Blah, blah, blah. Once we agree, we remove all of our armies and we just put that money in towards bettering our societies. If we did that in 20 years, our world would be completely different. Yeah. 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 <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's true, but. Yeah. yeah, I mean, but at the same time, it's like, I don't know, human nature also just kind of prevents that. So I'm what like, part of human nature do you think prevents that? Prevents ego. Yeah. What did you say? Ego. ego. See, but ego isn't human nature. It's, it's created by the stories. Ah. See, like, and, and the reason why I'm saying that is because I've met people from really dire situation, situations who have the best outlooks on life and they have zero ego. They're like, I'm so happy to get this opportunity. I come from this country and now I'm here and like, oh my God, like, I'm just happy to be here. I'm just grateful any way I can help. And you're like, wow. And then there'll be another person who's gotten everything. And they're like, my life is so depressing because I didn't get what I want and blah, 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 blah. And you're going, wait a second, this doesn't make any sense. So ego is really just the, the, the stories that you start to identify with that create the narrative of where you feel like you should be in your life or where you're going to go. But if you can remove ego, which trust me, you can remove your ego and look at things just with through real perspective and you realize ego is just a bunch of stories. But then so I don't think human nature fear. is ego. What's that? Fear. Like I say, you know, country A has a military because they're well, fearful that's, of country B. That's what I'm saying. If we removed all of the things, there'd be no fear for it. If everyone said equal playing field, no armies, no fear that we're, we're, we're actually making a law, no nuclear bombs, no nuclear threats, no warfare of any kind when it comes to uh, virology or anything that's going to be in the air, nothing. If everyone agrees to this, why would there be a fear? But I'm someone's going to agree. This. Say they What's that? Agree. Well, I'm saying if everyone agreed to that, which let me ask you a question. Yeah. Would you agree to that? Yeah, I would agree to that. Okay, Zach, would you agree that. to that? Obviously. Yeah, I was talking with my friends about this last night. That's crazy. Okay, Wendy, would you agree with this? Yes. Okay, so when you say human nature, we're a bunch of humans who just all agreed. The people who would not agree are the people who make the most amount of money. See, that's the difference. Sure, yeah. most and when the lose. people who make the most amount of money can make you think that you should not agree, 
Well, then we're back to that part where I was saying before, which is about controlling the mindsets. Because all of us people would say, why? We don't want nuclear anything. We don't want to be possibly threatened with anything that we we ingest or we don't want any of that stuff. But there's someone at the top like, but we got to protect everything. We got to do this because we need to keep every time they say, because we, the we is not for us. It's for the people who make that much money. Mm. Then, then people, maybe people would start thinking, oh, that pers- person D said, or group D said they agree, but they might secretly be, you know, cultivating an army, you know, co- you know, yes. And then that's what they'd they be fearful of the possibility, but that's yeah, why we need, we exactly. need leaders and we need leaders in place that are thinking consciously. See, a lot of times we have leaders who are thinking financially, but, and it's, it's hard. Listen, I get it. If you take on a role of being a leader of a country, you're going to look at people as just part of a society. You're not thinking of their individual life. It's impossible for you to, if you have 250 million people, you're not thinking of everyone's life and their story and their, what happens with their kids. No, you're thinking of the overall good, the overall whole. And that's where you're going from. If you know, in order to keep this country sustained, you need a certain level of finance because unemployment rates are up and a lot of people aren't specialists at their jobs. And there's a lot of complaining and a lot of nitpicking a lot. If you know that's what's happening in society, you're going, okay, these people can't govern themselves. A lot of people can't govern themselves. You can literally tell them, here's how you want to do what you want to do. And that person will not do it because they will go on a wishing well thing of, if I read books on this, or if I get law of attraction, or if I go over here and I rob someone, if I manipulate someone, if you just say, here, do this, do this, and the other, it'll work out. But a lot of people won't do those things. So they don't govern themselves accordingly for the results that they want. So yeah, in that sense, people are going, oh, we don't know what we're going to do. But if you broke down just a human needs, this is all the human, this is all humans need. You want security. That's all. You want security. You want security that there'll be food there tomorrow. You want safety of shelter. You want to make sure that nothing can, if it rains too much, you're not sitting underneath it. you got a cave to go into, something to dwell in that's, that's safe and secure. You want relationships with your family and relationships with friendships. It's very simple. And you want good ones. If you had a choice, great friends that you can succeed with and grow with or friends who are going to take you down from their own internal dramas and misery loves company, you will always choose the friends that are going to make you better. So you just want good relationships. So we're, we're pretty simple when it comes to our needs, and we'll, we'll add sex in there too. Actual just need, that's how everyone's wired. So these are just actual needs. It's not, it's not like, uh, like rocket science. The minute we start putting into the value of money, status, products, uh, programming, manipulation, um, government, or governance and government, um, and we start adding all these things to it, that's when the brain goes, oh wait, I can't, I can't keep a hold of all these dramas it's too much and that feeling of being too much is where people get depressed you're like so what's going on like oh, i don't know there's just so much going on like what do you have food yeah do you have security yeah do you have a relationship yeah why don't you have a relationship well because i wanted that and then i wanted that and then i wanted that okay so you don't have focus yet you don't you don't know yourself yet about what you actually want who you actually are okay you may need to work on that so it's like People have a couple of things, but then they start adding in, well, then this person said that to me about my pronoun and this person doesn't like these kind of color people. And if you were to ask any being from outside this planet, what do you think of, you know, human species? They'd go, they're still fighting about the fact that the color of the sun has some of them darker than the other ones. So they're still on level one of the game. Like that's how you would look at it. You go, these people are still fighting about, they realize that when you cut the skin, it's all the same, right? Yeah. Like they, they figure that out, right? Like <laughs> everyone has the same heart and everyone's got the same rib cage and everyone's got the same skull shape and everyone's got the same femurs and everyone, these are all bones and all nerves. All the nervous system is exactly the same. There's not one color of a person who has a different nervous system. It's mm-hmm. all made exactly the same. And someone was like, yeah, they know all that. But for some reason, but, they don't see it. Oh, because it's not on the outside. The thing on the outside is how they look at things, how they perceive them, and then they have a media training them to believe what they see is what's in front of them. When everyone knows, there's tons of uh, things that you eat and you don't know what's in it. And then when you find out what's in it, you're like, whoa, I shouldn't be eating this. 
So you buy it with your eyes, but then you do a little bit of research and realize it's probably not good for you. Mm. Most people don't do that little bit of research to say, why are we arguing? So I think once people start realizing that first of all, racism and any of that stuff is a programmed idea. And I'm telling you from someone who uh, mixed with a bunch of nationalities, all of my family members are different. I didn't even know what racism was until I was like in my twenties. I was like, whoa, these people are crazy out here in Florida with these flags. And they're like, you could tell like they're really racist out here and like some areas, you know? And I'm going, I didn't even know what this stuff was. And then I progressively saw it throughout my life. And I went, oh, wow. Yeah, this is a training thing. Cause I never even experienced this stuff. You start to understand how so much is just what you're taught how certain people have a lack of just financial knowledge, which I definitely was. Why? Because I just wasn't taught. No one taught us how credit cards work. No one taught us how, how to save money and what to spend it on. And no one taught us that's stupid to buy expensive things when they don't have real value to just attract people who just want valuable things. And then once you don't have that money, they're going to leave anyway. Like no one taught you these things. And if these things were just normal, logical discussions in a young age and the value system had been changed, yeah, our whole entire world would be different. So, you know. Yeah. By the way, man, thanks so much for the scene camp, man. Thanks for what you're doing with it, like giving us all these opportunities, man. I mean, I, I, I ain't gonna lie, I might pass on the next one because I, I yeah. can't, just can't be using computers so much lately, but I would love to join it in for sure. Um, uh, appreciate but, it. um, yeah, but yeah, dude, like, like, um, like, like for you to put your name on our tracks, man. And, but not only that, like actually giving us guidance throughout the whole like week and the you know, two projects and just like, like we were giving us, and so like, it's just like a great opportunity to learn so freaking much. And I mean, a week in the, within a week. And then also like actually being able to send our tracks up, up to the top and, uh, yeah, I mean it's incredible, incredible Pleasure, man. So I just want you to know that you know, like I appreciate it. I'm sure, and a lot of folks are appreciative of it. My pleasure, sure, Ben. So. I, and I appreciate you saying that because yeah. you know what's always hard is, um, I think sometimes if uh, if you don't know how deep this stuff goes, like the level of knowledge, you know, yeah. Banner, you we've been working for a while, and, and you're always growing, right? Which just shows how yeah. much there is to learn, right? Exactly. And so I try my best to show everyone like this isn't an overnight thing. This is, you got think of it, a doctor who wants to be paid a lot of money has to go to school for eight years. I'm trying to help people get to a certain destination within a couple of years. Like there's there's major music colleges that are not teaching at the level that I'm teaching people in even our group. Yeah. And these colleges are taking $250,000 from people and those people can never make that $250,000 back. So it's actually putting yeah, people in more bad. debt. Yeah, more debt than they'll ever be. So what I do is I try to give people information and then these camps, I think I see people grow so much that it really excites me because I'm like, wow, if you take a lot of people who are really talented, give them the information and then kind of work and, and, and fine tune all these things. It's basically like uh, what's it called? Iron sharpens iron. And you see it happening in a, in a week's time. And if I could take that and then show the executives I work with, who are some of the biggest people in the music industry who trust me and say, listen, here are the people who I'm helping out with. And they come back to me like, man, Adam, these people are getting really good. To me, that's really exciting because it shows that it's all about information and execution. It's not about my personal feelings. It's like if I can teach you something and you can figure it out and do it your own creative way, you can execute. And the same reaction will happen from a high level executive who's hearing all the best songs in the world is going to be like, whoa, I like this. The scary part is when people don't understand how much is on the table. That's the scary yeah. part. So when someone's like, oh, well, I don't think it's worth that. Or I don't think that, it, you know, what he did was that hard. Or I don't think, and I'm looking at this person going, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Wait a second. Like, you only have a couple songs to your name. You have no one to send it out to. Oh, because you have a good voice. You think that that's just going to be the ticket in. And I'm going, do you know how many people have good voices? Look at American Idol. Go look at all the people that you don't even know who won it. So like you couldn't win American Idol, but even the American Idol winner is not doing something right now. There's a show called The Voice. How many people from The Voice are on the radio? Yeah. So then when someone does that, it's always weird to me because I realize that as much as I can show someone the best way to do it and, and put them on my back, so to say, um, I realized over the years that carrying people is really hard and not saying my legs aren't strong enough to do it. My legs just don't want to do it. 
because I know at the end of the day, when you carry people who believe that they're supposed to be carried, when you get to the destination, they jump off your back and they, they kind of say thanks and they forget that you carried them there because in their minds, you were supposed to. That's yeah. the people I try to watch out for. And so like whenever yeah. I hear like a murmur of, oh, I don't think that it was that hard. I'm like, yeah, make sure that person doesn't come again because yeah. I, don't I, I can't put my name on the line for that person. I'm not going to walk them up this mountaintop. And then when I get there, they're going to expect that that was my job to do that. And mm-hmm. I've, I've seen that. I've seen that, man. I'm telling you, like before I even had this club, we had a recording studio and I would literally watch my investor business partner spend a quarter of a million dollars with someone. And the person would be like, yes, when I get that big contract, I'm definitely, we're paying you back your money plus this interest and your interest is going to be, you know, 20% or your interest will be whatever they, they discuss. And then I would come in to produce the acts. So I'd start working on these acts. We do 20, 30 songs. We would get them in front of these major executives. They're in front of LA Reed. They're in front of major publishers. They're in front of Dr. Luke, Max Martin. We're getting them in these doors. They're getting experiences they would never have had if they never met myself and my business partner. It would have never happened for them. And if it did, it would take many years to happen. We go ahead and we do all this stuff every single time without fail. There's not one that's, that's shocked me yet. Every single time they all kicked everyone out who helped them get there because once they got there and the person said, okay, we're going to give you, you know, $200,000, their minds went to, well, I don't want to give, I mean, I know she spent $250,000 and I know he spent over a hundred thousand dollars, but, but now I have the money. So how can I not pay them back really because, you know, without me, they wouldn't have this opportunity either. And so, like, I'm helping them out as well. They don't look at it all as a business investment. It's crazy. And then the people, the new people that they're working with, always feed into them because they know how to play the game. So the other people are going, like, yeah, 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 yeah. No, like, this is, you know, it's normal. You know, you got to you gotta grow, you know. So you got to leave them people behind. And then the, the artist is like, well, you know, I did sign a contract. And they're like, no, nah, that happens all the time. Like, we got a lawyer. You know, we can just say that you didn't understand it, you know, da, 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 da. And the artist is like, <laughs> you know what? I didn't really understand it. I, I didn't. And you're going, yeah, you had a lawyer when you read it the first time. We always had lawyers help the artist out. So there's not one contract we did that a lawyer didn't work help with the artist. But you'll see this artist start to change. I'm letting you know. Every single artist that I've ever seen my investor put money into and that I put money into those things, all of them, when we got them to the place that they wanted to be, found a way to undercut the investor. Damn. All of them did. All of a sudden, the percentages went from 20% to 5%. And even the 5% ones, they never paid back on. That blows, man. That's terrible. It's crazy. And, okay, I'm not going to say this, but it's just being and you're real. still down to do this. Like, whoa. <laughs> that, yeah, see? Man. See? And that's why, this is the reason why I do things in steps. Like, mm-hmm. we got to learn the business a little bit. We got to learn production a little bit. So you can't be completely reliant on one person. You got to learn how to hold on some of the accountability. If you don't know how production works, you don't know how hard it is. So that's why a lot of artists, especially singers are, are like, well, you know, he produced the track, but I don't think I should give him any percentage. And I'm like, but did you pay him a lot of money? Well, no. Well, then he probably deserves something or she deserves something. Whoever's producing. Cause that's not easy. Cause if it was easy. You would do it. So it's the reason why I always tell artists, like, learn some production so you understand how hard it is. And so that way you can bring something to the table other than your voice. Because what a lot of artists do, and I don't know if you've ever seen someone do it, I'll say, did you produce this track? And especially if it's a good track, they love to say they, co- they co-produced it. They're like, well, you know, yeah, I mean, he, he produced it or she produced it, but, you know, I brought in the original, and they start telling me all this, I brought in the original chords, I brought in the blah, blah, blah. I, I said, that's cool, but that's not production. That's composition. Yeah. Uh-huh. who produced the track well you know i was in the room and so he would ask me if i liked it that's not the question i asked i said <laughs> who produced the track they always like to put themselves in a, in a perspective to where they are equal to the person who did the most amount of work and i think it's unfair and until people start saying it's it is equal if we're equally doing our jobs yep. so if that producer helped you with writing Writing is not a prerequisite. He helped you with writing or she helped you with writing. If they produce the track, that's a whole nother job. That's two jobs. So they are carrying a certain level of weight. If they're helping with the melodies, on top of it, they're helping on a whole nother job. So I try to teach these things in steps. And then I'll just be very honest. When I see a couple of those red flags, I address them. And if I see it again, I completely subconsciously disconnect from that person. 
So like I can be super nice to people and say, you know, like if you need help, I'll help you, blah, blah, blah. But in my brain, I've already red flagged that person as someone who's a potential threat. And so I, I cut them off internally. You see a red flag from me, tell me right away. What's that, brother? If you see a red flag from me, tell me right away because I'm, I'm 41 and I can't be messing up anymore. You know what I mean? Fair enough, man. <laughs> like, I, I, I always address it. But yeah. see, here, here's the thing, though. You're keeping it real. You're like, I'm at a certain age and I don't want to backtrack. I, yeah, I can't play around. I have too much on stake because this is what I still want to do. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not yeah. let's give it a try thing. And I think you've seen it a little bit more this year because I'm like, definitely talk to my wife and everything. I'm like, if it's going to happen, I need to put the time into it. And it's been like the scene cap. I literally slept like three hours every day because I still had to work. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's still to him, but it's like, if I don't do it, nobody's going to do it for me. And so here's, let me here, ask you this question. Um, in that sync camp, noticed how we able to work as a team, right? So you threw some tracks, we got some notes. I helped out. I sent you some samples. We were to add some yeah. to it, right? So we were able to even co-produce, even if it's virtually around the world. And in one week, get some really good material. The two songs you did were two great songs that the company is already pitching. They're already putting on their roster, start putting in the placements. So that was just one week. Imagine if you did that for not saying not sleeping, but if you had like the thing and you figured it all out and you were able to do just yeah, one, one song a week for 52 weeks and you have 50 songs in your catalog at that caliber, you're making a living. Like it's impossible not to yeah. make a living if you have that many songs at that level. Um, but what happens is, is that most people don't put in that time. So for instance, someone might come to sync camp and they're like, well, I did this and that was a fun thing, but you know, I think I'm better just kind of doing things on my own because I'm an artist and my artistry is way more important than all this other stuff that I'm doing, right? What happens is that person has those two songs and then they don't have more songs for the rest of the year. So they don't have another 50 songs. So they might record a couple more songs and they get done with their song. At the end of the year, they have 10 songs done. 10 songs is not enough to compete in the music industry. But they think that it is because of the voice. And that's the scary part. The voice, the one thing I've noticed is that someone's voice can be their greatest downfall. It's kind of like, like someone's beauty can be their greatest downfall because it's like a calling card. When someone sings, they have a good voice. Everyone's like, oh my, they get instant reaction. Oh my God, your voice is so good. So in that person's mind, they go into, wow, when everyone hears me sing, they really react. But they don't realize that every single person who has a great voice, people do the same thing to. So all around the world, everyone who's on Instagram and TikTok and Snap this and this thing, the other and YouTube, everyone who has a great voice, whenever they sing, people in their circle say the same exact thing. Oh my God, you have a great voice. But here's what you don't hear. Oh my God, you wrote that song so amazing. Mm. I hear way more great voices than great songwriters way more great voices than great songwriters it's very rare and here's so check this out that's why when you get someone like an adele that's why she's so valuable she's not only one of the best voices she's also one of the best songwriters john mayer not only one of the best guitar players in the industry in the last 30 years also one of the best songwriters that that duality it even takes someone like bruno mars not only one of the best voices not only one of the best performers not only one of the best songwriters but he's also a top producer mm. he's producing for CeeLo green so if you have people who have not only the voice but they have all these other things that's when you start realizing where the real playing field is and so I hear a lot of people just go, oh, he got such a great voice. And I'm like, cool. But you realize there's other buckets that have to be clicked off if you're going to be at that level. Ed Sheeran, he's not only a good voice. He sings, he raps, he produces, he writes for other artists. He plays with a loop pedal. He does a full concert on his own. He doesn't even have other band members. Like, So I'm glad that you're saying the things you're saying because my goal is to hopefully get everyone to such a realistic understanding of the business they're in that they don't allow excuses or their own self sabotage thoughts or undermining themselves get in the way. If anything, they just go, no, I'm going to be one of the best at a business that I know there's a lot of talented people in. So I need to really focus on things that are, have longevity in them and not 
quick ways of getting attention and inserting that yeah. because that always messes people up. All right. Not not um, only that, also um um I want to get to the point where you you can benefit of what I do. You know what I mean? Because of uh, I mean, it, it doesn't make sense. I'm, I'm at least as a, personally, I've learned so much, especially this last year, and and I feel like growth and stuff. That I'm like, if I'm able to give back to you in some sense, that's like, because the monthly thing is like nothing to what you're teaching, you know, it's like nothing. It's like, I mean, that's why it, I, it's like sometimes it feels like a sacrifice that you have to do it if you want to keep being in the game, you know. So. So, yeah, that's kind of one of my things that I've been having in my head is, like, if I can get to the point where where what I do can bring value to what Adam does, it's like, that's that's changing the chapter completely. Yeah, man, that's beautiful. And I, I appreciate you saying that. And I think if everyone had that mindset and not for me, like, getting to the point where they bring value to the group itself, this this whole organization becomes a truly powerful um, machine that the whole entire music industry has never seen in the whole entire world of music ever conceived. Like think about this. If you have a hundred people, just a hundred people who all know the secrets of hit song early, I'm teaching you who all know how to make high quality songs, who all understand how to create win-wins amongst each other, who all help to promote one another, who all understand finance, who all have a network and they all help each other. That's never been in the music industry like ever throughout all of history. So it's always interesting to me because I'm trying to give um, as much perspective as I can and trying to give as much as I can because there's gonna be a certain point where, and I'm just telling you this because I've been thinking about this, is like getting to a point where, let's say in five, 10 years, that the people who are active in the group the most can find some way of social currency to make a living from the group where I would just walk away from it. Now I wouldn't be walk away like I'm just gone from it, but like I financially I'd be like no I'm 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 over here now. But anyone keeps the group going, you all make percentages off the group, and the social currency of the coin that the group has. That's like one of the goals that I'm thinking of because at the end of the day, I think that's how we keep regenerating things, right? But we have to have enough structure and foundation for that to be something where it's lucrative, where it is bringing in money to where that happens. But my goal is going all right. Well, if we get 500 members, and let's say there's 50 great producers in the group. Well, we should be able to put these producers on like a monthly stipend. They should get $1,500, $2,000 a month, but they can record a bunch of the acts and they can make really good deals with the artists like percentage wise, but they know they have at least 2K a month that's coming in towards them. Okay, so we have to make X amount of money in the group for that to happen. But that means they don't have to say, oh, I I can't work with you this week. I can't work with you this week. And maybe it's all the people who are level four and five or the ones who get free recording time or free blah, blah, blah. But trying to figure out how it can work to where people who are putting in their time and effort can be financially stable internally is my whole mission for all of this. Um, but it just has to get to that point where there's enough people who can hold on to that kind of, you know, architecture without it falling down. Well, while we're on the next- yeah. I-, I wanted to ask while we're on to talk about the sync camp. Um, yeah. I-, I noticed that he said he was working during the day and he was able to do the camp. Um, is it because that you would send the files and he would do it, let's say, when he's off work and he would be able to do it and send it back in? How are you or doing, Pablo? It, it... No, this time I basically uh, moved all of my work around the same camp. Gotcha. So if I needed to stop something, I'm like, uh, I freelance a lot of my stuff that I do. I do a branding consulting and stuff like that. So I'm like, it was kind of at a risk to even lose a couple of clients, but I'm like, is it going to be worth it to put this effort into it? Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it's like this type of situation for me, I think you have to narrow it down to that. Is it worth it to try to prove what you can do, what you can get to, that you can give more than you can give uh, what, what is actually requested? Because it's not, I mean, I hit the wall a couple of times and Adam is the one that came in to uh, save the day. And, um, but I, but the, I think one of the things that helps with age is recognizing that you have to let go of some of the stuff that you want to control. Mm -hmm. So if he says, if he says, this is 
this is that. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to argue with somebody that lives off of this that is trying to give me a door. Basically, it's giving it to me because this is not something paid. I'm not going to argue with him and come and say, no, 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 no. I want it like this because I like it and it feels better like that. I'm like, if he's asking for it, he knows why he's asking for it. So I respect that sure. and like put my time into um, accomplishing what we need to do because I think some of some of the sense that I got is like not from everybody, but sometimes it would be like I could not make time for this. It's like okay, this is what I told my family when I was like because they're like why are you not sleeping? You know, like my parents and stuff. Like well, I'm not sleeping. I'm trying to get this opportunity and respect what has been given or laid on my hands because basically it's like falls on my hands if i don't respect it it's not coming back yeah i get that i had to put my effort come here go home at seven uh at three four in the morning wake up take my son at seven in the morning hit the studio again and then i recognize coffee's not doing anything else for me anymore so it's harder (laughs) but like But it's just the it's just the pressure of where do you want to be in life with this type of scenario? Is it really what you want to do? I mean, Adam's like that's one of the things. Sometimes Adam pushes just a, a little phrase that is the one that makes everything click. Sometimes it's not even the whole class. Sometimes it's the whole class, but sometimes like it's like a little wake up call, you know? Yeah, for me, I'm basically so I just to, asking about timing-wise. Uh, I just wanted to know how you were able to time it. Yeah, you, know you have what I mean? to push through. Yeah, yeah okay, cool. Through. Understood, understood. I just wanted to know how Sync Camp works because I wasn't sure if it was like a certain time or it was back and forth and you were able to do it oh, and send yeah. it back in. So as, as far no, as time... I'll tell you another... Go ahead, Bob. I'm sorry, just tell you one more thing. As far as um, sometimes you don't get the same effort from the whole group. For sure. So you have to, so if you're interested, you have to come and even try to push through the part that they're supposed to do. I just did that with an album, I I understand. Yeah. You know, like I got got vocals that were not recorded properly. I did not go and find a a percentage or anything like that. I just like, I need to do the best I can with what I have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we were fortunate enough that the vocals were retracted and it helped a lot. But the good thing is that whoever needed to retract them wanted to have that quality there too. Mm-hmm. So we all put our effort, and at the end of the day, it's a it's a team thing that if everybody on the team understands, it can happen, you know. And it and I learned a lot. I learned too much. Like like the pressure is is great for learning. <laughs> yeah, man. So as far as the uh, the the breakdown of the the timing, just for anyone else who happens to watch this. So basically what we do is every morning around 10 a.m. Pacific time, we have a briefing where I bring in sync um, opportunities from different companies that send them to me. And we go through and we put everyone in teams based on everyone's strengths and weaknesses. And then it's usually teams of three to four people. And then basically what happens is we do a whole entire briefing. We look at the references. We look at structurally what they're probably looking for, the executives and why they're looking for what they're looking for. Then we break into our groups and depending on everyone's time schedules, they kind of internally make the schedules that work best. So, if, you know, if the if a producer and the artist and writer can meet at 2 p.m. that day, then that's when they'll meet because someone has a job or something and they'll work on the track. And then maybe uh, maybe the producer has to go to work. So then the artist and the other writer will then continue writing it and then the producer will come back on. And it, it's basically around everyone's different schedules. And so then the second day, so on the Tuesday, we'll make, meet at the same time, 10 a.m. Pacific, and we will listen to the songs and see where it got within the first 24 hours. And we'll break down and do like a, a, a detailed, like really, really fine comb tooth type thing where, okay, we need better vocals there. We need this lyric to be better. We need this transition to be better. Sonically, we need some changes and we'll then try to help out. So it's, we go through a whole entire second listening party. Then everyone works again, finishes up. Then on Wednesday, we come back and basically listen to um, the finals that people had gotten from there. And we don't go crazy and we will give notes, but we get into the next briefing. So then we get another briefing on Wednesday. We work all Wednesday, listening party on Thursday. Then Friday, we have like the final listening party, which is that um, the uh, uh, both songs we listen to. And then 
on Saturday and Sunday, people have the ability to fix up any notes they had from that week. And then we try to deliver a full playlist to these executives by that Monday. Mm -hmm. Now that's the goal on this last one. We didn't hit it. We got some people had it by that Monday, but some people need another full week to really flesh out everything and, and all that stuff. And that's kind of normal. Like in most sync camps, everyone is getting things done within 48 hour time, uh, turnaround time. Mm -hmm. um, like for any publisher that I'm with, um, you know, if I work with, in, so, with Sony or Concord or position music or any kind of thing, usually it's 48 hours that we get a song done. But sometimes when people have a lot of clients, you know, a lot of producers I work with, they have a lot of clients. So we're in the middle of a camp. They took off time for the camp. But if they really want to make something like A+, plus, they might spend, you know, a, a week after that to finish it up. But I always recommend to people is that your efficiency level should be able to get a high quality song done within 48 hours from the writing, the recording, all the production and mix should be done within 48 hours. Once you're at that efficiency level, it's, it changes your whole entire um, business structure because normally people take a couple of weeks to get a song done. So if they have a client, like an artist, they can only be paid that one fee per week or two that takes them. But if you can do a song in 48 hours, that means you could take two clients on a week. You instantly change your income in a year from just executing within 48 hour turnaround. So one of the biggest changes in my career is when, once I logically understood that of just like a client base where, okay, it takes me like, for instance, when I first started, it would take me two weeks to get a song done. So if I can get two weeks of song done, that's only two clients um, a month. Yeah. If I go to 48 hours, that's two clients a week. So it goes from two clients a month to eight clients a month. I just quadrupled my income. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I really understood that because also when you can get songs done in a fast turnaround, um, executives will want to work with you more because they have to wait on it less. So when they say, you know, hey, Zach, I got this song. We're looking for this artist on the label or hey, Zach, we're looking for something for a TV show or a commercial. And you go, hey, cool. And they, they say, hey, when can you get it by? And you go, oh, give me like two weeks. That person's going to be like, uh, yeah, but the meeting's tomorrow. Mm. So they're not going to come back to you. And it's not like a bad thing. They're going to say, Zach's super talented, but it'll take too long. And there's tons of people that are my friends. I shouldn't say I have tons of friends in that sense. There's tons of people that I know who we've talked about this with my friends who the producer is great, but it takes them two weeks to get something done. So executives, once they find out the first time, like, oh, how long does it take you? Once they understand that number in the head, the executive goes, okay, cool. And they will never reach out to that person again. They will always go to the person who gets the same exact result done in 48 hours. Yeah. So once I start realizing not only does it affect your client base, but it also affects your executive base and the artists that work with you. And then lastly, and this is important too, and you won't, you won't really discover this until you're working on albums um, and albums. Well, I'm talking about major labels where there's actual money on the line for rental of studios, rental of hotels, rental of, you know, when someone flies to your place, let's say to work with you, someone's paying for that. You know, so yeah. if someone says, oh, we're flying out to Canada to work with Zach, how long you got to be out there? Well, we're doing uh, 10 songs. OK, so how long is that going to take you? Four months. Like someone's paying for four months then. Mm -hmm. But if they're like, oh, we should be there. We're going to do all the writing on Zoom. The production's going to take about two days a piece. So, you know, 10 songs. I'll oh, be there a little bit less, maybe a month, maybe a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Well, then it's going to be a lot easier for a manager to want to send clients to you. So it wasn't until I really understood that because top artists, they come through areas. So they'll go, so-and-so is coming through LA. Want to get them in a session with you. Mm. So, you know, because they might live in London. They might live in New York, but someone's coming through and they have a couple of meetings, but I want you to be in the studio with them. And you're like, okay, cool. If you can't get a song done those two days, that artist starts a song with you and then leaves and goes back. And that opportunity of being on their album just goes pshh. Out the and that and that one song could change your whole entire life. Mm -hmm. So when I notice that it's all connected, your production time, your quality, and your ability to have fast turnarounds are all connected to your income for the rest of your career. That's when I double down of like, okay, I got to study this stuff. And that's why I went hyper into studying production. And, and for anyone who watches this or anyone who's here, what I do is I have literally a roster of characteristic types that each producer that's at the top or at least one people that I studied, um, they have certain characteristic traits in their productions. 
So I know Timbaland is going to do this because I studied Timbaland. And I know Pharrell is going to do that because I studied Pharrell. I know Max Martin's going to do this because of what, so I know how their styles are enough to when I'm in a room, I can use certain tricks directly because I know it always works. Mm -hmm. So I can say, I know Pharrell always repeats the first couple bars of his songs. Like if the first, first bar goes, you know, then ink, like this is a guitar that goes Ben ink. Every single Pharrell song starts, goes Ben ink, Ben ink, Ben ink, bank. Doom, 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 doom. It all starts with that first one bar and he just repeats it. I know that Timbaland is always trying to make a beat that makes your head nonstop bob. He's always doing that. So he's in, adding interesting percussion to constantly make this groove of a, a head beat. So I know I'm going to try and do that if I'm looking for a groove that people can dance to. I know Max Martin is going to use very small chord changes in the chorus and sometimes drop to that seventh note that sounds like a diminished, but come back to the one before. Like I know their little tricks. So I can roll through a roster when I'm in a room and never have writer's block. Because if I ever get stuck, if Adam gets stuck, I go, what would Pharrell do? What would Timbaland do? What would Max Martin do? What would Calvin Harris do? Like, what would, what would people that I study do? And usually the answer pops right in. You're like, oh, he would do this. He would do this. He would do this. She would do that. Blah, 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 blah. And then all of a sudden, this, this answer that some people are having trouble grabbing onto is right there in front of the room. And then you can just go, okay, so that's mm -hmm. the trick that works here. Um, and most people, when I talk to them, especially producers, and I'm like, who have you studied? They've really never studied people. They've heard songs from people. But if you say, what BPM is that? Oh, I don't know. What key is that song in? Oh, I don't know. What's the chord progression of that song? I don't know. How many sections? Of, I don't know. Then it's not studied. Because mm -hmm. anything you studied, like if a doctor says, oh, how does the human body work? Oh, I don't kind of know. It's like, no, it's studied. They know all the pieces. Same thing with song structure. It should be just as well known as if a doctor was talking about a certain body part. So that's my trick for all that. Um, all right, y'all. I got to run because I'm going to be back on, in, on on YouTube to do a breakdown of a K-pop song in half an hour. So I need to get a little bit of a break. But I appreciate coming out and hanging out today for the consultations. Um, these are always really Thank good you. talks. And uh, we always get summer with them. So it's, it's great to see everyone. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Thank you. Adam. My pleasure. Awesome. Have a great day. Yeah, you too. All right, everyone. Talk soon. Take it Later. easy.